to call the uh, September uh, 25th school committee meeting to order. Uh, for tonight's agenda, we'll uh, start with uh, public comment, then we'll have reports. Uh, and, uh, uh, excuse me, then we'll have the consent agenda, then reports. Uh, and then under new business, uh, we have uh, do the, the both the uh, substantial uh, material in both uh, reports and not to rush through either. We're going to uh, move the data presentation to our next meeting. So tonight we'll just have the uh, special education update. And so uh, that that's the agenda. Uh, so with that, I, is there any uh, items that aren't on the agenda that people would like for public con comment? Yeah. <coughs> yes, Mr. Town. Good evening. This is just very brief. I wanted you to know that around 8 o'clock-ish, you might get an influx of people have an interruption because there is that grade 8 challenge day parent meeting this evening, and I know parents that were trying to be in both places at once. But I just wanted to briefly touch on something, not on the agenda, because there's a lot going on tonight. You all probably have seen the survey data that's come out, and I'm sure at times it's been difficult to read, and some things, you know, clearly when someone can be anonymous, they can say a lot of things. And I just, I, I don't want that to, um, even when there's criticism of this board and the school administrations, I just want to remind you that when you're concerned about trust issues, we in the public appreciate when you guys can have spirited debates and ask tough questions. I know we all want to have a positive spin with all of the financial challenges that are coming, and it's tough to look at that data, but I just want to remind you, I guess just like you're doing this evening, that the best way to keep the public trust is to show that you're asking the difficult questions and that we know you're asking the difficult questions, because I know there's a lot that happens behind the scenes and in office hours, and I've talked individually to all of you. So I just wanted to keep that, have you keep, remind yourself of that, because we in the public appreciate that. You're, you're our voice. You can ask, obviously, a lot more questions than we can, and that's just all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Mrs. Downing. Appreciate that. Is there any, any other public comment? Yes. Do you mind coming up just so we can use the mic? Thank you. I have a um, letter. Okay, that's uh, you want me to yeah, so or? we'll you we, we can uh, we'll, that's one of the agenda items of the spec of special education. So if you okay. want to save it for then, okay, that would be great. All Thank right, you, so you <laughs> Thank you. Public is uh, if sign we have a sign in sheet over there. If you're giving public input, just we just ask to make sure that you also sign in. Okay, is there a uh, motion? On yep. We'll, um, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> we'll move to approve the consent agenda as presented. Second. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? 5-0. And now we'll have uh, reports. Caitlin, you're up. Okay, so we have the senior parent guidance night tomorrow for any parents of seniors at RMHS. That will be at the Performing Arts Center at 6.30 p.m. till 8.30 p.m. Um, and then also the middle school open houses this week on Wednesday the 27th at 6.30 p.m. Thank you. That will be it. Quick report. The um, Rakasa held a, a event this <coughs> last week um, at, I forget which day, but 7.30 in the morning, a breakfast with members of the Chamber of Commerce to um, basically inform businesses uh, what basically not only what CASA is doing, but what they can do and resources that are available to businesses in the community. <clears throat> or it was also open to business people um, in the, the whole North Reading, Reading North Reading Chamber. 
So I think it was attended by about 15 or so uh, business members, and there was a, Erica did an excellent job, and there was a lot of good questions, a lot of good resources available. And um, RACASA especially has worked hard with the Mystic Valley Consortium to prepare information for businesses specifically in the trades, because the businesses in the trades um, have an <coughs> extremely high proportion of um, addiction issues, and especially heroin. And on RACASA tomorrow night, um, here is the candlelight. Am I right about that? Candlelight it's tomorrow vigil? night, yep. Tomorrow night at 6 o'clock here at RMHS is the candlelight vigil. It's recovery month, so this is one of the events that's part of recovery month. And then on the 28th, also here at the Performing Arts Center at 7 o'clock is the RACASA annual meeting, and Dr. Ruth Pote is going to be speaking, um, and she's specializes in the mar addiction and marijuana. So I um, highly recommend both of them. Thank you. Mr. Chair, um, just a quick update. Um, I've been contacted by two members of a new group in town called Reading Embraces Diversities. They're red for short. Um, they're, uh, it's a very wide group from the community that are involved. And they're having their first event on Tuesday, October 3rd, right here at RMHS at the Performing Arts Center from 7 to 9 p.m. It's called a Night of Listening and Learning. Um, and again, it stands for Reading Embraces Diversity. So the idea is um, coming together as a community and, and figuring out how we can make sure that we're inclusive and welcoming and that everyone in the community feels safe and welcome. And I do believe the town manager, the superintendent of schools, uh, and the police chief will be there that evening speaking. So just wanted to make that announcement. Thank you. Sure. Dr. Cox. Um, just in addition to that as well, and Dr. Anna Ornstein, who is a yes. child psychiatrist and a Holocaust survivor, will also be giving um, brief remarks um, because she will be coming back again for another event. So this is the first of many events. Um, so I also have a report on the for the CPAC. The meeting was on Thursday, September 14th, and I actually wrote this down to make sure I could be as succinct as possible. It was a packed meeting, um, both of people and of staff. Um, when you go to these meetings, I find it's really energizing because the parents know so much um, and are so invested and the interchange seems so real. Um, Mrs. Downing was just mentioning about asking tough questions and tough questions get asked and answered and um, I, I, it's really an honor to be the liaison. So um, at that meeting, um, Student Services Director Carolyn Wilson introduced the um, special education leadership, most of whom were sitting around the table, and there was time for questions and answers and discussion. Um, last year, a survey was launched that was a collaborative effort between the Student Services Director, um, the staff, and CPAC, and the goal of that was to invite people to give their feedback after IEP meetings so that there could be the feedback for improvement or discussion. It's an anonymous survey, and the link is on the website, on the Student mm -hmm. Services website. So if you want to check that out, um, it also comes on the after the IEP meeting. It's mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. literature that's given out. Um, we talked about how um, Mrs. Wilson is the go-to person. She's the one, not the school committee, but Mrs. Wilson is the person who is working with curriculum and um, the day-to-day -day details of special education. Um, and she talked about the positions that remain open and that have been filled and that were on the brink of being filled actually that night. Um, and about also the funding for um, professional development and the cuts that were made, but the ways that, the creative ways that professional development is still being funded. Um, she told the meeting, the people at the meeting, that she'd be presenting tonight, and I see some of them here, which is awesome. Um, so last year, another discussion ensued about um, the International Dyslexia Association. Last year, Ms. Wilson was honored as a board member, and so she brought up and asked the group whether they wanted to join so that they could go to meetings, the staff could go to meetings, there could be train-the-trainer opportunities, 
Um, and the group was very interested in that. So I think the end result was yes, they are joining. And so these opportunities and the, the bonus is that their annual conference is in the area so that people will be able to actually attend that conference. Um, they discussed the bylaws um, and they're coming up to an election. So Katrina Path will be the election coordinator and um, you can find their e her email address online on the CPAC page in case you'd like to nominate yourself or someone else. If you nominate someone else, she will be in touch with that other person to let them know they've been nominated. They will still have a choice. Um, there were also discussions about other ways to engage more parents in the CPAC as well as a discussion about how to keep the school committee apprised of CPAC concerns and activities. And one idea that was brought up was to ensure that the liaison, the role that I've been playing, actually rotates after the term, after the liaison term. So as much as I might want to stay on the CPAC, that the group was discussing how beneficial it would be to have other school committee members on as working as liaison so that different people would have the experience of meeting the parents at the meetings. Um, and so that's something that the school committee were researching what the policy says about length of time and that's something that um, will be discussed. Um, another um, point that was discussed was the invitation for the CPAC to present itself to the school committee. And so they are going to be meeting with Mrs. Wilson about that. Um, and projects that they're currently working on include different speakers, um, as well as a linked up, that's um, the current name of the program, which is like a mentoring program that would enable new or transitioning parents of children with special needs to buddy up or seek support or experience for more experienced parents. Um, and I just want to say a special thank you to Alicia Williams, who has been at the helm of the CPAC um, two years, two, two years, and has worked with the group to get the, um, the website up and cards, which she brought with her today, and a lot of other projects. So a special thank you for you and, and the rest of the board. Um, dates coming up. October 4th is the election meeting, and that'll be here. October 11th, the basic rights, rights meeting hosted by the Wakefield CPAC, and that's here as well? That's or no, Wakefield. that's in Wakefield? Wakefield. Sorry. <coughs> um, and on the 28th, there is an, a meeting on the IEP for my child. Mm -hmm. And on the 20th of, that was October 28th, and on March 20th, Sarah Ward will be presenting, um, it's pending, but the thought is that she'll be presenting on executive function. Um, so there are lots of other opportunities to connect with parents um, and to learn about special needs. Um, and um, those are both at these meetings and on the website, so check it out. Thank you. Gail? I guess I have one item to do. We've included within the packet tonight two separate memos, and what we wanted to do was update the school committee on a proposed change to the fiscal 2018 capital plan as it relates to the schools, and this will be discussed in more detail at the upcoming financial forum in October, as well as the upcoming November town meeting. Based upon a review of the capital plan, which we do in the fall each year in preparation for the financial forum and the town meeting, we've worked with the facilities department as well as the town manager, and we've identified a problem with the wood end skylights that we would like to address as part of the fiscal 2018 plan. Included in the packet that we have is a memo that the town manager has prepared regarding the source of funding for it that he will bring forth as part of the November town meeting. We've also included a memo from the architect describing the issue. We also have Joe Huggins and Kevin Kabuzi here from facilities to address the item as well as to answer any questions that we have. And then what we will be doing once it's been discussed as part of the financial forum, we will bring it back to school committee to have the school committee vote on adjusting the capital plan as it relates to the schools prior to it going to town meeting in November. 
Yeah. I'm having a little trouble finding the middle. I know it's towards the end. Very okay. I think it's new. I see go it's, from the it's back. It's the last, it's the last piece. An electronic copy. Uh, there we go. Thank you. Joe, did you have anything you wanted to? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Great. <coughs> So everybody has the memo in front of them now. So we were doing a, a roof inspection, which we do two times a year on all of the town and school buildings last summer. Um, and we were up near the wood end, uh, the skylights, which are on that second floor corridor, which run about 120 feet of total corridor length. Mm -hmm. And we noticed that there was some cracking in the polycarbonate uh, skylight system, which is a heat-formed one-piece unit that goes across the... The, the roof structure. Um, when we noticed that, we also noticed that as we were up close that there was some, the, uh, the vapor barrier and the, uh, was failing, which was allowing moisture to get in between the two layers of the polycarbonate. So we engaged the services of uh, an architect that we use for a lot of projects here in the town of Reading in the school department to look at it. And um, as you can see in the memo that you guys are looking at right now, um, they are failing. Uh, it's a one-piece unit. That building is a heavy, uh, it's a wood frame, heavy timber building, which is, uh, does move, and we've seen that happen when we've had heavy snow loads on the roof of that building. It, it does move normally to allow for the you know, additional weight. These are a structural, structural piece of the building, the skylights. So what we were instructed to do is to keep any heavy snow load off of them. And when we go around in the wintertime and we have snow, like all the other buildings, we've been removing snow off the skylights and away from them to keep you know, weight off of these units because they do tie the roof together at the top. Uh, so that's when, what we did with the architect is engage them to do a partial design to give us a solid cost estimate for replacement so we had a good number going into the capital plan. Um, and the number that you are seeing is, to, is for the full replacement, including, um, you know, project management, um, including uh, demolition, uh, which could be done over the summer, which would be um, the, obviously the best time to get something like this done. Mm -hmm. um, they're saying that they're probably one to two years out from, you know, needing to get done, but we'd like to get this done sooner than later. Um, we don't want to have, you know, any leaks and then get water infiltration in the building, plus they are structural. The curbing that these sit on, there's, there's curbs that these units sit on are in good shape, which is a good thing, uh, and that's what moves when you get weight on the roof. The new system will be a different design. This was what uh, 10 years ago was a popular setup to put the polycarbonate one-piece units in. The new system will be a modular hinged skylight system that will allow the build, the, the, them to move and it'll be modular in design. So if anything were to break, we can replace individual panels, which we don't have the ability to do right now. So that's why we're asking for the capital plan to be amended in November and get the design done. I've engaged the architect to get the design rolling. We should have a complete design and bid package ready to go by the beginning of December. So if it's approved at town meeting, then we can move forward with um, putting it out to bid through the procurement office. Joe, when the when the architect did their report, did they uh, explore not having skylights just put in the, or what that would cost? We, we did talk we about did that. Talk and about that, that those skylights provide natural lighting into the building, and we would have to reconfigure the whole lighting on the second floor of the building. So the basic part of the design of the Wood End School is to allow those skylights for natural light in the building. Mm -hmm. So it could be done. It would make it very dark, and then we'd have to be doing And the savings would be actually minimal because because they're structural we would have to add in more structure on the roof line to tie it all together and then there'd be finished work to do on the inside of the uh, hard ceiling that's underneath so the savings wasn't really worth it would have probably netted out with the additional lighting and everything so I'm trying to remember when you started with us whether oh six this project was that was oh four seven was it oh it was oh four oh is the first school year mm. So I just was wondering what the, you know, was this a, an expected lifespan issue or is it, is it premature? I mean, nobody likes to see something like this fail. I mean, the good thing is we caught it. I mean, when we were doing our inspections, that's the benefit of, you know, having that as a PM when we go around and look at the stuff on the <coughs> roofs. And we do have roof surveys done every year. 
I'd like to see something like that last longer. But skylights do take a beating um, <coughs> because they the UV rays. That's part of what did this to them. The UVs um, from the sun, the heat up there on the roof. So Plus, it's a wood frame timber building. So is the new material, um, you know, going to provide greater protection or? We had talked about that today internally in our office about um, having some sort of tinting put on these things to because it does get awful hot on the second floor and we've added return air fans which just brought the temperatures down, but we would probably do something with um, some tinting on the, on these windows also to get the solar gain down on the inside of the space. And that protects the material the new, as the well. The new the new skylights themselves uh, are re have replaceable panels so that if anything did fail, you can pull it out and replace it. And they do move. These don't move at all. That's the other problem when they heat up. Oh, yes, they're cut. Yeah. Yes. Have we satisfied ourselves that there's no, you know, claim or, you know, kind of faulty design in the product that we're replacing or the, how it was installed? Yeah, the warranty was up uh, two years after they were installed on this particular product. And the lifetime for the new solution? Do you have any I think it's a 25-year warranty. I'd have to find out for sure. I'm pretty sure that's what he said. It was a 25-year warranty on the new ones. You. you know, we do work, I'll give you an example, this high school skylights, we've had leaks on those, but we can replace the gasketing material on those, so we've done that, to, and you, you're going to get that. They do dry out, same as these, we will be doing that. If, if we run into an issue, at least you can service them. So the serviceability is part of the problem. So two-year warranty, 13-year Two-year warranty on, on uh, workmanship. On, the, on installation. The, but the previous one was a t only a two-year yeah. warranty. It lasted about 12, 13 years, mm. and it's going to be 540K to mm. replace. 480 so. is the total price of the project. All right. Well, I'm glad we found something better. Yeah. No, I had a question on warranty, but you just answered it. Okay. Just, uh, there's, and I, I just want to ask, is there's no way to go back to the project or my understanding to is go back no. to the what, what do you mean to go back to the project to the, 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 the original architect or no the statue of limitations would be over at this point thanks joe all right all set no. um, not for joe i just the um town manager's memo outlines basically where where that funding will come from, that's going to be reviewed at that the financial reviewed forum, reviewed at financial forum. Mm -hmm. and then again at town meeting. <coughs> right. So the total was 480, you said, John? Right? Mm -hmm. okay. Just to clarify for the community and for the committee, which I think you know, is that the funding is, is a capital project and would be uh, coming out of the, the town funding for capital projects. This is not a school department budget operating expense. Yes. If I, I just, uh, speaking of the town manager's memo, I wanted to say how impressed I was with it, the thoughtfulness of his financing plan for this. And um, this entire experience, while unfortunate, um, I think it is an example of how well the, the reporting structure of your position works, with you reporting both to the town manager and the superintendent of schools. And um, this memo yeah. is a reminder, like we saw last spring, of how well the town and the school sides work together. Mm -hmm. And I felt... Um, I felt his memo was particularly supportive of the schools and just wanted to say that, and obviously your work as well. So. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Okay, thank you. Have a good night. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you. <coughs> Gail, was that? That, that was all. Dr. Dari? I have a couple of things. Um, first of all, which many of us know, uh, I unfortunately have to start off with a sad note, is that last, last week, uh, a member of the community is a student at Northeast Vocational Technical School who's a Reading resident, Matthew Duggan, passed away. Um, Matthew went through uh, both Parker Middle School and Barrows Elementary School, was a, was a sophomore at Northeast Vogue. Um, he has siblings at Parker. Um, this, certainly our thoughts and prayers are with the Duggan family during this difficult time. We, um, we did, it did, cause a, a, a real ripple effect in our school community, um, particularly at Parker Middle School and at Reading Memorial High School. Um, and I just want to commend both the Parker staff and the high school staff um, for the work that they did last week um, with, the, with those students and staff who were affected 
um, and had Matt in <coughs> class many years ago. So I just, I just want to commend the work that Principal Ricky Shanklin and Adam Barker and the guidance staff at, at the high school and all the staff at Parker did. Um, I know it was a difficult le week last week um, for, for, the, for the, those communities. Um, I do uh, want to bring up a couple other things. Uh, one is, and we, we did send this out to the school community this week, um, and that is our parent university, our first annual parent university is going to be uh, Saturday, October 21st. It's going to be from 8 a.m. to 12, 15 p.m., and it's going to be held here at the high school. Um, this is something that we've wanted to do for a couple of years. Um, Cindy Calandrella, who's our extended day coordinator and director of adult ed, is, is leading this and has put together a terrific program. Um, she also wrote a grant with uh, Reading Cooperative Bank, and we are proud to announce that Reading Cooperative Bank is going to be funding the entire parent university. Um, and it's going to start off with a keynote speaker, or keynote speakers, actually, um, Dr. David Walsh and his daughter Erin. Uh, who we've actually had, Dr. Walsh, here in the past, um, is going to do the keynote. He's going to, uh, they're going to present on connection, unleash his children's potential. Um, and then we have two different sets of workshop sessions that are going to focus on different areas that parents uh, would be interested in. Um, and you can see that some of the things that are, and this is in your information packet, um, some things that we're going to be presenting include navigating the cyber world, Intentional parenting, um, the Reading Youth Risk Behavior Survey results. Uh, we're going to have a panel of students talking about raising students in the digital age, um, among other things. There's going to be several different workshops available. So we're very excited about this first annual, and uh, we hope that this is going to be the beginning of um, many of these opportunities for parents to learn more and, and, and gain some, some additional skills that. You know, that they may not have had um, in different areas. So um, I want to thank Sandy for all her hard work on this and for all the people that are going to be presenting. John, quick, um, John just a quick question. Yep. So the, um, I see that there's free child care. Uh, thank you. I forgot about that. So we are going to be offering elementary age mm -hmm. students child care. Um, that will be in the field house at the time. We have different activities that are planned uh, for the field house. And that's funded. That funding is helped. Uh, through the co-op? Everything is being funded or through donated. the grant. Okay. There is no operating funds being used for this event. Okay. Thank you. I also do want to clarify one. Uh, I've received a couple of emails now, and I, I think that I want to make sure that for the community and um, to understand is uh, the I've gotten some questions about Veterans Day this year and why uh, we are having school on Friday, November 10th, isn't that Veterans Day? Veterans Day is actually on Saturday, November 11th. Um, the state holiday for Veterans Day is on Saturday, not on Friday. So Friday is not an official state holiday. So it is a day of school, and I know some school communities, some school districts have decided to uh, have that as a day off. Um, we chose not to. November is a very choppy month to begin with. Um, with conferences and Thanksgiving and a professional day. Um, so this is not, it is not a state holiday. November 11th is actually the official state holiday um, in Massachusetts. Next year when it falls on Sunday, the law says it is on Monday. So next year, yes, Veterans Day will be celebrated on the Monday. That is the official state holiday. So I just wanted to clarify that as to why we are having school on that day. Now uh, we will have the uh, special education update. Uh, there's going to be uh, two parts of this, the uh, mid-cycle uh, review and then the OCR uh, report. Uh, I'd like to keep, uh, for both, both sections, keep questions till the end of each. So we'll stop it after the mid-cycle if, if people have questions and then same for the OCR. Uh, I mean, it, with, with regard to the OCR, uh, <coughs> you know, it, it's uh, a report to uh, you know, tell us what happened and then uh, what uh, corrective actions taken place 
uh, you know, I'd like, I don't, I'd like not to get negative. I, you know, we have to learn from it, uh, and and uh, you know, hear what we've done to correct it so that it doesn't happen again. Uh, I would like also, you know, the committee will ask questions, and then I'll I'll open up to the audience, uh, and and I'd like it to be questions, and and we we, we can have some statements, but. Uh, not a lot of, you know, I know Ms. Williams has a statement and I think you, you had a statement, that's fine, and then there's a couple others, but also uh, keep in mind that we'd like to, you know, have questions uh, as opposed to editorial uh, comments or whatever about why something wasn't done right. Uh, we know that, uh, we're, we're addressing it, and trying to ensure that it doesn't happen again in the future. So uh, with that, uh, Ms. Wilson. Thank you. So I, as um, was just mentioned, I'm going to be reviewing the mid-cycle review first, and then I'll go through the OCR complaint. Um, so we um, had the Massachusetts Department of Education um, came out to conduct our mid-cycle review. So if people remember, in February of 2014, the Department of Education came out to do a coordinated program review of all of the programs, all the special education compliance areas, as well as ELL and civil rights um, here in Reading. I wasn't here at that time. I did review the report and the findings um, in the fall of 2014 to go over um, what the department had found. So as part of this monitoring cycle, every three years we have a mid-cycle review, which is the halfway point, where the Department of Education comes in and takes a look at how we're doing in the areas that we were found in non-compliance, and then they might identify either new regulations or other areas that they would like to take a look at. So to begin with, the Department of Education did reschedule this three times. It was originally scheduled for December of 2016. Um, they moved it a couple of times due to some of their staffing constraints. Um, and finally, we were able to have them on site April 25th and April 26th of 2017. So they were on site for two days. Um, as I said, they focused on the areas that were found non-compliance as a result of the coordinated program review. Um, in preparation for this, during the summer of 2016, I completed a self-assessment, which included a record review of six student records, which is what the department requires. It's not my selection. This is just the requirements of the Department of Education, as well as I had to upload to the department certain documents that they were looking at in the areas of noncompliance. The department then, um, the week prior to the on-site dates, provided me a list of 17 students that they wanted to see, so 17 additional records that they wanted to review when they came on site. Um, so we were notified of that, which was the week of April vacation, and um, when they came on site April 25th, there were two members from the Department of Education who spent the day reviewing those 17 additional student records. Um, they also interviewed, and this is per their request, one special education teacher, one team chair, and myself. The department determines um, this process, they determine the records, so those 17 additional records were based on our student roster that was provided to them, and they select the students they'd like to take a look at. Um, they, uh, they inform me of how many staff they would like to interview, um, so that's kind of the process. Um, so now I'm going to go through each criteria. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but I did provide you the regulatory <coughs> language, which is how the department reviews this. So the first um, criteria was the timeline for determination of elig eligibility and provision of documentation to parents. So we were found to have this partially implemented. So the finding is that we were not consistently providing parents within 45 school working days of receiving a signed evaluation consent form. We were not providing them with a proposed IEP or um, a finding of not eligible. Um, so this was based on the review of the information that was provided. Um, our corrective action in that is we need to conduct an internal record review to ensure compliance with these timelines. We also need to do a training of all of our staff. Um, I've reviewed this requirement with all of our principals as well as all of our team chairs, and our team chairs are reviewing that with all of the special education staff at the building level. Through our IEP software, we have a report that um, easily allows us to generate this 45-day 
um, marker because it is a, a requirement, a tracking requirement. So I have the ability to, as frequently as I would like, to um, conduct that review. And we need to submit um, progress reports to the Department of Education. So if you take a look at the mid-cycle review, it actually indicates the dates that we do need to submit to the Department of Education, our internal record review. Um, and what needs to be included in that documentation. So we've, we've done some retraining, we've worked with our principals on this, and um, you know, we, our goal is to be reviewing those timelines a little more frequently um, in order to be in compliance with this piece. Just so people understand, this regulation, and I think I've talked about it at previous meetings, is when we have a consent to evaluate, we have 30 school days to complete the evaluations, and then this regulation is saying then we have an additional 15 school days within which to write the report, um, get that to parents, and hold the meeting and produce an IEP or a finding of no eligibility. So I just want to give people a sense of what kind of goes into that 45-day timeline. Um, so it's, it's evaluating the student, writing the reports, making the report available to the parents two days ahead of the meeting, having a meeting, and then um, either proposing an IEP or finding the child not eligible and sending a, a letter around that. So that's what's encompassed in those 45 school working days. The next area, it was SE 13, which has to do with progress reports and content. We were found to have this partially implemented. The, the main area that we did not have consistent documentation on is when our students either graduate or they um, terminate because of their age of eligibility. So as you know, we, we service students until they're 22. Um, we're required to do a summary of academic performance for these students who either graduate or who age out of special education, and our records did not show that that was consistently happening. Um, again, our corrective action is an internal <coughs> record review and training of all of our staff. Um, that has been reviewed with high school um, principals. It's been reviewed with all of our team chairs. We're also going to be doing some more in-depth training. I think I had mentioned to you all last year we worked a lot with Alan Bloom on IEP writing. He's a retired professor that our staff really um, enjoy his work. So he'll be coming back to do some more work with our high school special education teaching staff on this process. Um, and we also, um, we've created um, uh, some team chair process documents, and so we'll be adding this to that to increase our monitoring around this area. Uh, next is SC14. We were found to have this implemented, which is the review and revisions of IEP. So this means that at least annually we're reviewing IEPs and that when there are amendments um, in between that annual review, we had documentation that the parents had agreed and the changes that had been made. So this was an area they found was fully implemented. Um, and this is just some of the feedback they provided us um, on this. Um, SE18A is IEP development and content. Um, and again, this was found to be implemented. So when we find a student eligible, are we providing the parents with the IEP? Um, and so the department found that um, a review of our student records and, and staff interviews indicated that upon determining that a student is eligible, the IEP teams develop an IEP and they address all the elements of the current IEP format, so what the Department of Ed requires us to have in the IEP. Um, and that we also are addressing bullying, harassment, or teasing, and also special accommodations for those students on the autism spectrum, um, again, as outlined by the Department of Education. So this information was found in our student records that they reviewed. Determination of placement and provision of the IEP to the parent. The finding on this was partially implemented. So the requirements we have when we have an IEP team meeting is that we need to produce the IEP immediately. The guidance that we've received from the Department of Education is that if we immediately, um, according to the Department of Education, is three to five days. They've put out a memo to provide some clarity, which is that if we provide the parents with a summary following <coughs> the meeting that outlines the major goal areas and the services being proposed, that we have two calendar weeks to get the IEP out. Some of the delays that were noted in the mid-cycle is that our principals sign 
the IEPs, which is a really important part of this because they're responsible for the implementation of the IEPs in their buildings. Um, so principals do sign that. And so there were some delays in having principals sign from the date the IEP was ready to go just because of the, the kind of workload. So we've reviewed that with our principals. Um, we've reviewed it with our team chairs. We're talking about ways to kind of make that more efficient. Some of our team, our team chairs typically review the IEPs prior to them going to the principal. So we're talking about in different buildings how to expedite that process um, because we do have two administrators reviewing the documents to ensure that they have all the right components in them. But that was really the delay that was highlighted in the mid-cycle report. Um, I think it specifically says that the principal, the date that the principal signed kind of was off in terms of that two weeks. So we're really gonna work on that, as I said again, we are going to be looking at our um, IEP software that allows us to run these reports to really take a look at compliance with the timelines. And I do need to conduct internal record reviews as part of our progress reporting. And then we are training all staff. As I said, I've reviewed the mid-cycle, these findings with the principals. We've talked about it at our team chair meetings. And then the team chairs are having these discussions with our special ed staff. We have copies of their agendas as well as sign-in sheets to submit to the Department of Education to review that. Um, SE 20, this is documentation on the IEP that our IEP teams consistently consider the least restrictive environment for our students and that we justify if a student isn't in the general education setting why that student is required to be removed. Um, this was found to be implemented that we're consistently as IEP teams documenting this information on the IEPs and documenting that we're having these discussions at IEP meetings. Um, SE22 is IEP implementation and availability. This is partially implemented. The concern on this um, finding is that when we have a delay in providing services due to personnel or space, we haven't, we haven't had a um, consistent way of notifying parents um, and also that we are offering a sole method um, of compensatory services rather than an alternative method. Um, so we had previously been found partially implemented on this um, back in 2014. I had submitted a process and um, a letter that I was using as a template to the Department of Education at that time. They had approved it. Um, we had someone different out during this review and she found that the letter that we've been using is insufficient. Um, so I'm revising the process. Um, I've been working with the team chairs and the principals on coming up with a process for this. So this um, area is really about when we may have a vacancy or a staff that's not available to provide services. It's not about when students are available, but it's when we don't have staff available to provide services. So we are looking, I am putting a proposal together for the Department of Ed to approve prior to um, me saying this is gonna be our process. Um, so one of the things we've talked about with team chairs as principals is having our special ed teachers, related service staff, and paraprofessionals submit their schedule at the end of every week noting if they did not provide a service so that we can track that more in real time. So we're trying to come up with a, a more accurate way of doing it, but I need to make sure the department is gonna approve that before I say this is what we're doing. So I'm happy to provide the committee with an update once I get feedback from the department. Um, in terms of the notification of parents, um, what they're asking is that when I send the letter, it needs to indicate two options, at least two options for families in terms of compensatory services. Um, typically, we've offered um, one option with a statement that says, if this doesn't work, you can contact my office. That wasn't sufficient for the department, so we need to explicitly offer at least two options for families in regards to compensatory services. So I'll be revising the letter to reflect um, that requirement and we've also reviewed this at our building levels I've reviewed this with principals I've really been collaborating with principals on team chairs to come up with a way to really best um, monitor this um, in a way that's efficient and effective for our staff that's going to give us the data that we need um, we have to develop an internal tracking system to make sure that parents are immediately notified um, we need to review student records as part of this and we need to train all of our staff on this um, SE 26 is parent participation in meetings that was fully implemented there were no concerns by the department about parent participation 
And SE37, um, there's a number of slides on this, is partially implemented, and this is our procedure for students who are in out of district placements, either approved or unapproved. Um, so the finding was that we didn't consistently have documentation that we monitor students who are in approved or unapproved um, out of district <coughs> placements. And um, so we needed to develop a system for monitoring out of district placements, including a monitoring plan. We need to have an internal um, oversight and tracking system, a review of student records, and training for all staff. Um, as many of you know, we did cut a 0.5 position of a team chair, which had previously been our out of district coordinator. This year, our model for monitoring out of districts is that every team chair has a caseload of out of district students. Um, we feel very comfortable with this, and the team chairs have spent a lot of time collaborating on this process. Over the summer, um, Kelly Boswick, who is our RISE preschool director, did an audit of all of our out of district records. She's created a spreadsheet for me that um, really looks at all the dates so that we have a baseline for monitoring all the important dates for our out of district students. We've also created a spreadsheet that the expectation is every team chair is completing for every out of district student on their caseload, which includes all the important elements. Um, from the Department of Education, including the monitoring plan. The team chairs have met and reviewed several different options of um, a monitoring plan, and we've come to consensus on the document that the team chairs think will be the most effective, so we'll be implementing that. Um, our team chairs will be observing our out-of-district students. They will be um, documenting that information in the monitoring plan, and they'll be including that information in the student record. Um, we really feel like by having team chairs who are building based and who are here full time, it allows our families to better connect um, with a team chair. Uh, they also have um, individuals who have knowledge about what's happening in our school programs and can kind of liaison between families and, and what's happening in district. So we have made some significant changes to this process and um, have created some systems that really will allow me to better monitor what is happening in a more real-time um, experience. Um, in addition to every team chair taking out of district cases, I also am taking out of district cases um, to help support um, just the overall monitoring. So I have certain students who are assigned to me um, as an out of district management. So that is it for the mid-cycle review. So I'll start with the yeah. When is the next mid-cycle review? So our next full coordinated program review will be in three years. So it's, so basically every three years, but they're changing the process, so we really don't know what it's going to look like. So next year they're changing how they're doing this. So I was, I was actually six. Every thinking, six is the. Thinking of it in terms of like an audit. Mm -hmm. They come out every year, they make recommendations, mm -hmm. and then they come back and say, what did you do? Uh, yes. That, have, that, that you wait three years yes. for that? Yes. We, we are reporting out to the department on these items in between, though. Yes. There are certain due dates yes. that we have to send reports. Mm -hmm. the, the other question I had is the, uh, the IEP software. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I can't remember. When did we actually start using that recently, right? Last year was our first full year of utilizing eSped. So we've really done a lot of work on cleaning up the data. Um, and we're feeling a lot more confident in the data. We've, we've aligned the practices with the team chairs to ensure that appropriate data is being put in because if you don't put appropriate data in, you don't get good data out. So we've aligned our processes um, in terms of how we code certain things so that the reports we're able to run will be more accurate. But, so yeah. a lot of these things will hopefully be corrected by mm -hmm. now utilizing the technology. That's what we're hoping is that that'll give us a better monitoring of these dates. And the other f last question I had on the, you mentioned the monitoring of the out of district placements mm -hmm. and that we had a .5 that was doing that and now it's been split mm -hmm. up. What happens, I mean, who holds the out of district placement responsible if something's not, not up to what the, the 
the services are supposed to be provided? That is a really good question. So that is our responsibility. The students who are placed out of district are our responsibility. So if we, so we did a lot of work this summer on reviewing IEPs, um, and it is our responsibility to go back and forth with the out of district placement. Sometimes we really struggle to get um, IEPs that we feel are reflective of the IEP meetings that we held. Um, so that takes a lot of work on our end. But ultimately, it's our responsibility. Um, if they are placed in a program, for instance, if they're placed in a program that doesn't have speech and language services, but we feel the student requires speech and language, it's our responsibility to provide that service at the out of district placement or the IEP team needs to consider whether that's an appropriate placement. So we have some instances where we are supplementing the services. Um, so in addition to paying tuition, we're paying for different services or consultation to happen with the out-of-district placement. But the students who are placed out-of-district are our students and they're our responsibility to ensure the IEPs and the services are being implemented, which is why the department is really stressing that we need to have this documentation of monitoring. Um, because it really shows our investment and effort in making sure um, that student IEPs are being implemented. Can I just follow up on that? So what's the accountability of the, of the placement agency, of that agency, and what if they don't, if we have all these timelines that we need to hold ourselves accountable to, mm -hmm. that the state's holding us accountable to, but if they don't provide us with the information or they don't meet when we need to meet, it can so be what, a challenge. I mean, they are also, so most of our private schools are approved private schools through the Massachusetts Department of Education as well, and they go through this process. Our collaboratives do as well. They have so they also program go through review. the same? Yeah. Exactly. yeah. It's a little different. The standards are a little different. But they have a coordinated program review. They have mid-cycle reviews. So both the private special ed schools and the public um, collaboratives also go through this process. So can I ask another Mm -hmm. To your other example, why, why would we have a select a program um, or th where that it doesn't actually meet all the need such that we have to provide additional services? Because maybe the majority of the student's needs can be met there, the student is comfortable in that placement, and we feel it continues to be appropriate as long as we provide this one additional service. Can I ask mm -hmm. All right. So um, back on um, finding nine. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I was, you've got the 45 days, but there's a lot of things that go on in markers inside that. Mm -hmm. And I guess I was wondering, one of those things is meeting with the parent then inside of that, mm -hmm. it sounds like. Yes. So I assume, you know, actually I did, I did at one point have one of my uh, children that I, I have, did have a meeting. So I'm sort of trying to think back of how we scheduled that. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess I'm wondering, you know, what happens if, you know, people are out of town, you can't get that <coughs> scheduled, and you end up, you know, if you can't get that scheduled, you're going to blow apart that timeline pretty quickly. So as long as we provide an opportunity for the families to meet, so we do invitations, we provide those opportunities. Sometimes it's, you know, the, the parents have to cancel the day of because they have mm -hmm. a sick child. So right. the department is okay as long as we have made an effort and work with the family to identify that. So when we send out invitations, um, one of the things we have been working on is that we send our invitations. Sometimes it may not be that I reach out to the parent and say, hey, does this date work for you? Because I need to document for the state that I'm making this available. But we can always work on other dates that might work for the family. Um, but we have to document that here's the date that's within that timeline. Because for us, to be able to get that IEP out by day 45, we really need to be meeting around day 35. Five-ish to give our staff ample time. I'm looking at my team chairs and kind of getting a sense of, I think, probably around day 35 mm -hmm. um, to have that team meeting so that we have ample time to get that document out to the family and to, and to have a good document. I mean, you don't want, especially when right. it's an initial, um, we don't come with a blank slate. If, we're, if a student is found eligible, but we also haven't developed an IEP before, and so mm -hmm. we're writing a, a brand new document. Um, so we need to make sure our staff have ample time to, to write that document, and they also are servicing the students. Okay. So. Can I, do, you did all yours, but yeah. I don't know. Um, so the, it's finding the 22 where the state sort of said, oh, this will be okay, and then a new person mm -hmm. came in and said, oh, that's just not okay, Let, you need to do something different. And now you're working on a process. 
um, and you said you know you want to get that approved and mm -hmm. I'm just sort of wondering hopefully we can get some assurances or better um, better feedback more comprehensive feedback from the folks at the state to know that this is really mm -hmm. what they because especially to Chuck's point if you know, they're not going to come back and check on it for three years. We certainly mm -hmm. don't want them to be coming back saying, no, that wasn't what we meant. Mm -hmm. We, so. I've also asked them if they have examples of other districts um, okay. that might be able to share versus reinventing the wheel. So if they have seen something that they have approved in this area, if they could, you know, would be willing to share that. I as would well. think they should. So. Okay. Um, okay. Thanks. Uh, so. I have a request and a couple yeah. questions. Sure. Three things are related. The request is, could we get an update? It looks like there were two key dates in the mm -hmm. midterm finding. There's the November 10th, 2017 mm -hmm. deadline for internal tracking yeah. and training. Sounds like you're well on your way yeah. to having that update. And then there's a February 9th uh, report on tracking system data mm -hmm. that we get from this. So the first one is setting up a system. It sounds like you're either have set up or mm -hmm. will have soon. And the second is reporting what comes out of that system. Yeah. So I would just ask if the school, my request would just be that I, I would be interested as a school committee member in getting an update in advance of each of those deadlines of how we're doing with respect to each of these. And I think this goes to my two questions. It seems like there are five areas, mm -hmm. if I counted right. And I put them in two buckets and I have a mm -hmm. question about each bucket. Yeah. So first request is the two updates. The chairperson can you know, decide how to, how to respond. Uh, the second request, so it's the numbers 9, 13, and 18B strike me as kind of docketable dates, I would say. If, the dates we can track with our software, right? The 45-day school working day mm -hmm. um, deadline, the providing the summary of eligibility ends, so we have to have a flag when eligibility enters, the student reaches 22, and then the um, two calendar weeks uh, deadline for providing IP and placement to parents. So those three, have we scrubbed the data to a point now? I, I'm sensitive that some of this may be trying to change the wheels on a moving vehicle. Mm -hmm. Um, because you're, you're trying to provide services and at the same time it sounds like you're doing an effort to kind of reclaim and, and clean data mm -hmm. sets. Do you have what you need to do that before the deadlines? Are you confident in the data set you're working with or is there more work that you haven't gone into here that still needs to be done? I, I do feel very confident. I have to say um, on the eSped side, we have an amazing um, clerical support person who has really done a lot of that work and worked with eSped and so every year we have to roll over eSped for the new school year you know to capture that students have moved to the next grade so Denise and Kelly Boswick our RISE preschool director spent a lot of time and the the software will tell us if there's an error um, that something isn't completed correctly and so they were able to do that work and share that out with the team chairs at some of our initial meetings to start us cleaning up the other thing that we'll be doing um, which we did not do last year because last year was our first year with the software is <coughs> once an IEP is active and signed and approved by the parent we are going to begin a locking process which means that it becomes a read-only document and our staff can't go into those locked active IEPs unless um, a team chair overrides the locking process. So right now they're open because there are things we have to do at the start of the school year, but um, we said by October 15th we are locking them, which I think is also going to help keep the data clean. So I'm feeling really good about the work that was done this summer to <coughs> clean things up and also that really it's the work of the team chairs. They've really worked hard to align their processes so that we're capturing what we need to capture to monitor this documentation. I mean, I think we need to work as a group on refining the report running capacity because the, the software has the capacity to run many reports and our goal is to set up some that are automatic so each team chair and myself are getting automatic reports from eSped on a monthly basis. But it has the capacity to do that which is really exciting. So when the re IEP is locked, the people that need to reference it can still see it, yes, correct? Yes, they okay. can see it, they can read it, they can review okay. it, but they can't, can't go in and it. change anything. And last, so last, team yes. Mm -hmm. Just last question of mm -hmm. the promise three. Um, so 22 and 37 were the other two areas mm -hmm. where there's action items that I heard. And these strike me as a little different than the first three, mm -hmm. uh, kind of less docketable, mm -hmm. if you would. Um, you don't have a definite time period. We have mm -hmm. to identify a delay, which mm -hmm. is, can be a subjective yeah you got to get out ahead of that, right? Yes. Um, and then you have to consistently monitor. It sounds like mm -hmm. you made a lot of efforts in that respect. So 
maybe you could provide some assurance to the, the people affected by mm -hmm. this that you know where it sounds like the delay identification process re requires some process, mm -hmm. not just software, right. and it, just that you've done everything you you feel needs to be done to meet the consistent monitoring mandate mm -hmm. or requirements of this to, you know for for this type of program. So I, I know you've talked about developing spreadsheets mm -hmm. and resources, but it just, is there anything else you need in the process side or the staffing side to be able to consistently monitor, make sure the state agrees with us mm -hmm. and what we think that means, and then make sure that we're identifying delays mm -hmm. as they, before they occur, and then respond right. to them appropriately? I think the, there are some, some cases, I wouldn't call them, they're easier to identify when we have vacancies or someone um, goes out on a leave. Those are kind of the easier ones for us to monitor. Um, what I've been struggling with with the department is when there's sort of staggered missed services and when do we determine that that's a trigger for compensatory services. So I've been trying to get some real concrete guidance from the department to say what is that trigger point? When do you consider it um, a delay or a non-implementation that would trigger compensatory services? Um, I explained to them that we had developed some internal guidelines for our staff to think about because I think it's helpful for teachers, principals, team chairs to have it in their head about what would trigger us to have a conversation. Um, but I'm not getting very far with the department, so I need to circle back with them about what we've discussed at our team chair meetings um, and really kind of try to nail down what they feel. Because that's my biggest concern is it's not something I can say, oh, our software is going to capture it. It's, it's really, it requires humans to report mm -hmm. and for us to track. But we also need to have some, some trigger points that are going to um, guide our teaching staff to say, oh, you know what, I missed um, three Wednesdays in a row because I had two PDs and a sick day. Okay, is that significant and then engaging in that conversation with their principal and team chair. But I need to get a sense from the department what they feel is that trigger. Um, I had some ideas, but I'm not sure that mine were in line with what they were thinking, so I just need to get a sense. But that's the hardest piece of this, and you, and you nailed that, is that we have to have something that is helping and guiding our teaching staff and our related service staff to trigger that conversation with their administration. And we felt that having people submit schedules every week that note when they were not available because they were sick or doing professional development would at least allow our principals and team chairs to have something to look at and start tracking. We have to work out what we're gonna do with that once we have it. Last question, mm -hmm. it's just the one thing I didn't hear in what you just said was What's the mechanism for incorporating parental feedback? So if a parent feels there's been a delay, mm -hmm. how do you handle that in the system you're setting So that's up? something they would reach out to their building principal or their team chair to talk about um, in terms of a delay. I mean, we've had instances where we've had a delay because of um, services were approved in May. We need to do some shifting in schedules. And at that point, we offer compensatory services for the missed time. Uh, so if um, for some reason though a child is sick, I guess you'd know about it. I'm just wondering if there's mm -hmm. obviously but it's not when the student is not available. It's only when the staff, staff is not available. available. Okay, that's what I want yeah. to understand. Yeah. I know there's other questions yeah. before I, I should have asked in the beginning. Do you mind introducing the, you, the sure. people that are All here? All the staff who are here. <laughs> yeah. So Kelly, do you want to start and just introduce yourself, and we'll go. I'm Kelly Decatur. I'm a team chairperson at Barrows and Kelly. Maria Polito, I'm the principal of Joshua Eaton. Liz Green, I'm a special education teacher at Joshua Eaton in the Bridge Program. Pam Doyle, I'm a special education teacher at Joshua Eaton in the Lone Star. Mm -hmm. Tina Fenton, I'm a team chairperson at Joshua Eaton. Jamie. <coughs> Jamie. Judy Quinn, uh, second grade teacher at Joshua Eaton. Susie Libby, second grade, the Jenna teacher for Bridge at Joshua Eaton. Allison Wright, team chairperson at Parker Middle School. Jean Duran, seventh grade, uh, special ed teacher at Bridge. Caroline Boucher, um, fourth and fifth grade Bridge teacher at Joshua Eaton Elementary School. Amy Lee Betancourt, um, Parker Middle School, Bridge, and fifth grade Brian Kent. Oh, Joanne, is it? Team chair at uh, high school for Adam Blessing, team chair at high school for grades 9 and 11. Wow. 
really thank, thank you for thank you. coming. Thank you. And they've all heard this mid cycle review already, so. I'm afraid that some of my questions might be somewhat redundant with what Nick said, but I might just need to hear it differently, so I apologize for that. Um, the way. <clears throat> The way I heard this and as I was taking notes, it sounds like there were nine areas identified. Mm -hmm. And in four cases, Desi came back and said, you have done what needed to be done. Mm -hmm. And in five cases, you've done some partial work, but you're not there yet. Is that, mm -hmm. I'm yes. hearing that right? OK. Yes. So and I do think this is what Nick was getting at. Um, the, it sounds like for a couple of these, several of them, increased monitoring is the mm -hmm. answer. Increased mm -hmm. monitoring. And it sounds mm -hmm. like the software is going to help you. But I have a question about the frequency. And I think you were getting it with systems. Like, what mm -hmm. system is in place? So I have a question about what is the system to ensure that this is happening in six months, 12 months, 18 mm -hmm. months? That's question A. Mm -hmm. Question B is, who actually does it? <coughs> is it you? Is it other staff? Is it team chairs? And I'll save question C, depending on the answer to B. <laughs> so in terms of the ongoing monitoring, ultimately it's me. Yeah. Um, I do that with the team chairs. Our goal is to be bringing that. The team chairs and I typically meet twice a month so that you know this will become part of our agenda as we start meeting more regularly. But ultimately it's me because I do need to report to the Department of Education <coughs> on this. So any of the internal record reviews that you see in here, that's really me that will be doing that. That's what I guess, Nick. So C is redundancy. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to literally throw you under a bus, but in the event, is there, do, is there someone on staff who's trained to be your number two to mm -hmm. keep this moving in the future? Well, I hope I that my team chairs can kind of take on um, and, and follow the process. I think they've been so much part of it that you know I do have a great team and I, I do rely on them to gather the information okay. um, but you know there's no one that knows everything that I do yeah. if that's you know there's no one dual trained I try to share they do ask about yeah. um, different things that I do <clears throat> and when there's time we do go over different things but you know, ultimately, it's me reporting to the department, and part of that is that they all have full caseloads of things to do, and mm -hmm. so right. I don't want to add one more thing to them, so mm -hmm. then that's something more that I... And I would say something like this district-wide systemically, you do want one person. Mm -hmm. Ideally, you yes. don't want different people. I mean, you really right. do want one person yes. doing that. So I do have a concern about redundancy mm -hmm. once this is all mm -hmm. established. And you want to look at what the systematic needs are. So. Most of our team chairs are building based or two buildings and so they may see something from a building perspective Which is great because that allows for conversation with their building principal like maybe there's a certain staff person that's struggling um, With meeting their timelines. That's more an evaluation yeah. process um, Systemically, I would like to really look at what the trends are that are happening systemically. Is it one building? Is it students in a certain program? Um, those are the things that as the director of student services, you want to be looking at those trends overall. Um, if there's no trends, then it's you know kind of a hit or miss thing we got to keep working on. But it is good to have that system-wide view because I'm looking at it in a different lens, if that makes sense. Two more quick ones. One is very quick. On, on finding 18B, mm -hmm. the records, um, Two copies of the proposed IEP have to get there within two calendar weeks. I was just wondering, can that be electronic or does it have to it, be? We don't do them electronically because we can't do it securely, unfortunately. Okay. So that's sending. We either offer, we either send it via mail or we offer the opportunity for families to pick up. Okay. Um, at our elementary schools, as you know, most of our families are picking up, so it's easy for them to pick up. To grab the copies. Yes. Okay, and my final question, um, and I think this is something Mr. Blobin was kind of mentioning as well. Um, I'd like, as a committee, to kind of have a conversation in collaboration mm -hmm. with you about how we can get updates on the progress on these five still partial steps. So I don't know if that's, mm -hmm. um, I liked your suggestion on the, the hard, mm -hmm. what did you call the them, date. docketable yeah. <laughs> dates. Yeah. Um, but on some of them that are less so, to come up with some systemic way that we can get updates on, mm -hmm. you know, we were here, now we're here, now we're here. Mm -hmm. I think that would be very so. beneficial. Thanks, Mr. Um, one of the things as I was reading through this, I kept thinking, I'm very glad to hear about the software because I was getting sweaty thinking about how do you possibly keep up with all this reporting. And at the same time, knowing the investment of the parents and the understanding that these aren't widgets we're talking about. These are kids that are relying on the services. And, and also hearing, we've talked for years about 
how you as director of student services is you're doing the um, you're doing the monitoring of videos you're doing uh, you don't have an assistant mm -hmm. and I was also wondering while I was going through this thinking about the teachers on the timeline when they're dealing with doing actual implementation as well as the assessment as well as the writing as well as the discussing and being available to the best of their abilities to both you and to the parents. So I was feeling very overwhelmed with um, what the requirements are and wondering, I know that we um, have been struggling with staffing and wondering about the staffing and how we are supporting our staff in doing this and supporting the parents in reaching the staff to have the necessary conversations. And I know that's a convoluted mm -hmm. question. And again, I'm relieved you have some software mm -hmm. to help you, but it still takes entering it mm -hmm. and following it. And um, getting the reminders and the docketable dates mm -hmm. is very helpful. But um, it doesn't formulate into a question, mm -hmm. but more, um, a feeling how what what is happening to keep the parents and the and the staff supported and talking and I know CPAC is part of that mm -hmm. um, which I've witnessed mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. it's <coughs> continuing at the building level it's engaging in those IEP meetings um, a lot of our special ed teachers who are the liaisons are reaching reach out to families in advance of that and make those connections. Um, but it is, I mean, the hard piece of the special ed teacher's job is the time management of all those different pieces. So it's designing the lesson to work with the student. It's tracking their progress towards their goals. It is then completing all the paperwork that goes along with those IEPs, writing progress reports, completing evaluations. And so we work really, really hard at the building level. And I have to give principals again and team chairs because they're doing the work at the building levels to develop schedules for those teachers that allow for all those things to happen. Our team chairs really work to identify IEP meeting times that can be convenient for families and also work within our teachers' class schedules so that they aren't missing services to be at an IEP meeting. I mean, there's so many pieces that go into um, that component. And so, you know, a lot of it is management. Um, and really helping sort of with that day to day and it's also you know we have a lot of new teaching staff so how are we supporting those new special education teachers who may be new to the field or relatively new to the field and new to our district and really helping them understand how we operate and what our expectations are so there's a lot of that and that is happening all at the building level um, so. and then another question that I had um, the timing that we have, the 45 days, the 30 days, does that adjust if there's back and forth? Because I know sometimes the IEPs that are shared aren't, everybody's not exactly on the same page. So, so our requirement is to propose an IEP within the 45 days. The parents then have the opportunity to respond to that, and then there can be back and forth. But our obligation at the 45-day marker is to make that proposal from the school district. This is the IEP that we're proposing. The family then has every right to reject, partially reject that IEP, and then we can continue to engage in that dialogue through the team process and reconvening the team after that. But we need to get something out sort of initially at that 45 day marker. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just have a question. So on East, the eSped software, does it, um, is it also analyzing, sort of analyzing the data and basically providing you with alert or is it just collecting the data and you have to analyze it? It doesn't really give me any analyzing. It just tells me, for instance, if I do run the 45 day report, it will tell me each school um, and the students who we've missed the timeline for. So that's really, I mean, it gives me enough data that then I can meet with the team chairs and say, hey, um, these are the ones that we missed the timeline. Let's talk about those. Um, we also can, you know, for instance, we run report on unsigned IEPs. So it just gives you a report of data. You can break it down by school. You can break it down by um, liaison. I'm thinking of 
you know, a software that would enable you to sort of set the gates and, and set the markers and it basically can point you right to where the issue is versus, no. because the concern Linda raised it, I, and I think Jean also touched on it, was, um, you know, we need, you need mm -hmm. to be able to support the team chairs, to coach, to observe, to evaluate, to help the uh, team improve. Mm -hmm. And if you're spending, you know, all your time with data and mm -hmm. compliance and uh, writing, you know, working on processes, um, then, you know, I, we're not doing some of the other things that can also help our mm -hmm. teachers and staff be, uh, be more effective mm -hmm. with students, and that's the goal. Mm -hmm. So that's why I was hoping yeah. maybe the yeah. data. I had think the other more. piece to remember, and, and as, as um, Mrs. Snow Doxer brought up, is that we have individual students and they're each individual cases. So even when the data is showing something, sometimes it leads yeah. you to actually look at the record right. mm -hmm. and do it more in depth because sometimes right. what the data is showing you in a software program is not actually the reality. And so you want to start, you know, kind of looking through that record to really gain a sense of what is happening in this case. Why are we so, you know, why are we so off in timeline? So that's really important too. Mm -hmm to really dig in to see were there multiple meeting invitations, were there, um, you know, did a staff person get sick unexpectedly and they were out for a number of days, is that the delay? And so, you know, you really want to dig into those cases sometimes because they're not just a number. Right. Uh, they're really important, there's important things happening in our schools, so. And that's time consuming. The mm -hmm. digging is time consuming and mm -hmm. any analysis that's outside of that is, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Yes. I had two questions about what I'll call checking our work. Mm -hmm. uh, there are two things you've said that staying with me. One was that you had pulled six student files to mm -hmm. review, and I think you said there were 17 more. Yes. So what did you learn from the selection of those 17 by the state? Was there any pattern to it? Did you, was there any lessons learned that, it just strikes me that they asked for three times as many files mm -hmm. as you looked at roughly. Yes, and they'll, and they'll ask for what, however many files they would like. Um, Really, the findings were those findings mm -hmm. um, that you saw. So those 17 records, really that was the information that they gleaned from those records. But were they random selections? They were a random selection. I'll be honest. They just okay. kind of sent me a list of students, some um, students who had graduated. They wanted to look at students who had graduated the year before. Mm -hmm. They wanted to look at a variety of different things. So they just kind of sent a random list, um, and we <coughs> pulled those records. and. Away they went. So when I didn't have a chance, I didn't do an audit of those records mm -hmm. ahead of time. Those were just provided right. to them. And I'm just wondering if there was any pattern among the selection, whether that's something we no. could learn from. No, I mean, they kind of pulled everything. They looked at everything from preschool to post-grad. So. And the, the second thing I, I noticed was just aligning when there's any element of subjectivity in a standard that we have to follow, you know, consistently monitor, what, is, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. Um, just to do anything and everything we can to mm -hmm. document with whoever's going to be evaluating us next time, whether mm -hmm. that's the state or whether you have, whether you can contact these evaluators again, but anything we can have in writing to say, you're doing all this great work, mm -hmm. let's make sure it's meeting the, the standard that's going to be required so that mm -hmm. we're aligned with whoever's going to be grading our work and mm -hmm. next time around. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you uh, for the patients of the community. Is there any community questions about the session? No. Anyone else? From the I actually yes. have, I just want to, um, I think I know the answer, but in terms of the follow-up when our students reach graduation and mm -hmm. one of the partial was, uh, partially implemented was um, writing a report to, for them to take forward mm -hmm. to wherever they're going to go, whatever mm -hmm. the next step is. Is that still on the team chair to do that? It, it flows from the IEP, so as people are getting new students, they're also following those to that. It's the special fellowship. ed teacher, the liaison who, the teacher who's the liaison for that student when they graduate would write that. So and it wouldn't be the team chairs writing that. And yeah. just the, um, forgive my ignorance, mm -hmm. so are we also part of the decisions as to where that graduate will go? 
or just providing a report and then the parents take and their support, their mm -hmm. outside supports take that to find the right. next steps. Right. So if they this is only when their their eligibility for special ed terminates. So if they have met state and local requ requirements and they've made adequate progress towards their IEP goals, they graduate, then eligibility for special ed terminates. So we write that summary and they would bring that on to whatever post-secondary experience they're going to. If a student is with us until they're 22, they would age out at 22, we would have that summary and it would go with them with the adult agency that may be working with the student and the family. So. Um, it depends on where they're going um, post-secondary, um, but it really moves on to the parent or the student to be responsible to then share information about their disability at that point. Yes. I just, <clears throat> I just have one more. Do you have, I, it's a two-part question, they're all two-part mm -hmm. questions. Um, what is your level of confidence that in three years these will all be fully implemented? And do you have any other time frames in your mind for sooner than that? Mm -hmm. Where in your view, I know the department won't come out and mm -hmm. tell you, but where you could confidently say, if the department came out, we would be fully implemented. What's your time um, frame? I mean, ideally, all of these you'd like to have fully implemented. I think the struggle are the ones that, you know, you both had pointed out around the ones that are not as trackable. I think that, you know, that's always our goal, that these are 100% implemented in terms of timelines. The challenge is that we're all humans and that we, I, we can't force things to happen. And so some, uh, some adults struggle with time management just like our students and so we have to think of ways <coughs> to support them. Um, so we've done a lot of, I've talked with the principals about that these pieces need to be part of an evaluation <coughs> procedure, the evaluation and supervision um, for staff because these are expectations for our staff members. So just training, as you can imagine, isn't going to result yeah. necessarily for everyone to um, be reminded of these expectations. And so for some staff, there is going to be that process through supervision and evaluation. Um, so I feel the timeline pieces, I feel more confident that we will be able to move forward. Um, I also am feeling really good about the work we've done on out of district and I do think in a year from now, I think our out of district cases are gonna be in a much better place. I am feeling better today probably than I've felt in a long time about the connection that our families are having with our team chairs. Um, and so I'm feeling really good about where, the direction we're headed in regard to monitoring our out-of-district students and ensuring that the, those students are included in our conversation about all students um, in our district. So, so that's one I can feel really good about right now. Um, so, Mrs. Downing. Just, just a very quick question. It was something Mrs. Wilson said that triggered it. When you said we're all human, and I thought about the docketing systems, um, systems in my law office where it isn't just about one person who enters it. Another set of eyes checks the data. Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious, can you tell me about the process for how, you know, everybody's human, the clerical person entering that 45 day could be off, and how does that error, how many sets of eyes look, look over the docket? We don't have a lot of set of eyes looking over the docket, so our team chairs look over it, and maybe our special ed teachers. Um, we, we don't have a lot of, layers of support to provide that level of oversight and then when we run those reports that's our third look at it but typically it's either a special ed teacher is looking at it and then a team chair or a team chair is implement putting the data in and then we're running a report and we're looking at it through that process so, well, at least the two, so you yeah. at least have the two sets typically two i would say is looking at the information but we don't have more than that thank you Yes. Who, who did you say was accountable in their evaluations for following these? You know, I, don't, I don't know. Any what of our staff who are involved in the IEP process. What about uh, administrators? And administrators as well. And um, so it's part yeah. of their evaluation. Yeah, well, at every I mean, level. it's part of the expe professional expectations. I wouldn't say it's this directly written, um, but some of the professional expectations through the rubric are about <coughs> meeting these expectations. Is it directly written for anybody? No, I don't think it's in the rubric. Not specifically for special no. education, no. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Hi. Um, just for clarification purposes, can, can I just kind of come forward because he's the 
Can you mind coming up? Only because if there's people watching at home, they will not hear you and they will really want to. <laughs> what is she doing there? Okay. Hi. So this is just for, I'm Jean Duran. I'm the seventh grade bridge teacher at Parker. And um, it's just like for clarification purposes. I think everyone who knows me knows I love my job and I love my kids. But I have seven prep periods in a six-day cycle and 22 different things to prepare. So if you look at all my English and my remedial reading writing and my two Wilson groups, so it's not that I don't want to get something out in five days. There are times when you don't know what to take off the plate. It's like it's, I either stay till 5 o'clock or something doesn't happen. And I think it's important for people to understand that we live in this place where we struggle with the juggle. And it's not that we don't want to do it, but that it, we really have complex jobs. We have a job as a teacher with a contract for the teacher, and we have a job for the federal government as a special education teacher. And times those two are at odds with each other. So just, I was, when you said before you were wondering how we manage, there are times when it's a little overwhelming. So mm -hmm. I appreciated that you said that, um, Elaine. That's really all I wanted to say. Thank you. I'm sorry. sorry. You said it. <laughs> <coughs> yes. Um, following up on Mr. Bobbin's point, um, I'm actually going to kind of put words in your mouth to make sure that this is <laughs> this is as I understand it. Mm -hmm. So you were asking, where is it written that this is a professional standard? In my impression from how you described it, and that's what I'm going to mm -hmm. share to make sure I have it right. My impression from how you described it is, if you're running reports and you start to see a pattern that's concerning, that becomes a conversation with the principal mm -hmm. and the staff member, mm -hmm. that becomes coaching, mm -hmm. and then if necessary, mm -hmm. it becomes a focus area for that one employee. Mm -hmm. Is that kind of how yes? So yeah. as opposed to this being written in everyone, no. you do no. the monitoring to see. Yes, yeah, you problems. see if it okay. is a consistent, it's a pattern. Then we work on coaching, just like we do with our students. We look at how can we support that teacher. We look at caseload. We look at you know, did this teacher have 15 reevaluations this year and everyone else had three? Um, and, and why is this getting in, what's getting in the way of meeting that expectation? And then we work on that as a goal area to support that staff person because we want to help them, you know, to be successful in our district. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. When we have the conversations about priorities, budgets, I think it's important to recognize that this area is, I think as we just heard, this is an area of following the law. Mm -hmm. This isn't an area of cost-benefit analysis. Mm -hmm. This is about following the law. You have to do what's in those IEPs. Mm -hmm. And so it, when it comes to evaluation, I, I would accept nothing less than perfect mm -hmm. compliance with the IEP, however we can get there, mm -hmm. uh, but making sure that, that we're following and reviewing those to know in real time mm -hmm. what's required, not after the fact, but Mm -hmm. As soon as a student is enrolled in a program mm -hmm. with an IEP, that mm -hmm. we have the ability as a district to follow that to the letter, and 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 of course go beyond that to, for the benefit of the student. But but we we can't do less than that. Thank you. Okay, you're ready to move on. Next topic. So we are going to review um, the complaint that we had. So um, just I want to clarify. This is from the U.S. Department of Education. So what we just talked about with the Massachusetts Department of Education, so they are different agencies <coughs> who have different interpretations. So I just want to make sure everyone is clear. This is the Office for Civil Rights. Um, so the Office for Civil Rights enforces several federal civil rights laws that prohibit discrimination in programs or activities that receive federal financial assistance from the Department of Education. So we are um, an organization that receives funding from the United States Department of Education. Um, uh, the complaint of discrimination can be filed by anyone who believes that an education institution that receives federal financial assistance has discriminated against someone, and these are all the categories that they look at. The person or organization filing the complaint need not be a victim of the alleged discrimination, but may complain on behalf of another person or group. Um, <coughs> These are the following laws that OCR has um, oversight over, so you can see the different laws that they review. Um, in both um, elementary and secondary education, they also enforce these in higher education as well um, for those institutions that accept federal funding. Um, OCR is involved with them as well. Um, there's different options for resolution, so 
Um, if there is a clear indication that the recipient failed to comply with one of the civil rights laws that OCR enforces, OCR might contact the recipient and attempt to negotiate a voluntary resolution, which is different than a resolution agreement. Um, there's also an early complaint resolution process that allows the parties to come together and try to resolve um, an open um, investigation. Um, and resolution of complaints can be done prior to the conclusion of the investigation if the recipient expresses an interest in resolving the complaint. So these are different options, and I've put the link to where you can find that information on OCR's um, website. Um, just some data to share with the committee is that um, some districts that are comparable to Reading that have also had investigations that have resulted in um, resolution agreements based on disability. Um, this just gives you some other communities that have also had similar situations to us. Um, and then there's also a report, the 2016 report to the President and Secretary of Education. I've put a link to that there as well. This indicates that Massachusetts during 2016 had 13 disability-based complaints that were resolved with resolution agreements. So this doesn't give us an indication of how many complaints were filed um, and how many were resolved through the other mechanisms that I shared. Um, this just indicates the number of um, complaints that resulted in a resolution agreement. And that's really all that I was able to find in terms of data. I was trying to find some more because I know people had some questions about um, how many districts have engaged with OCR. Unfortunately, I was unable to locate data, that type of data on their website. This was all I was able to find. So, But there is a report there um, if people are interested in reading sort of their report out. Um, so to give you a sense, we have a complaint um, that we received um, on June 9th, 2016. Um, I just want to kind of go through this timeline. We were required to submit documentation to OCR. We submitted that on July 8th, 2016. That documentation included, but was not limited to student rosters, student IEPs, teacher schedules, and other supporting documentation related to the allegations. Um, once we started the 16-17 school year, we did have one um, day that the OCR attorney was on site conducting interviews and doing some observation. We had additional follow-up phone interviews with the OCR attorney who was investigating the case. We did submit throughout the 16-17 school year, additional documentation was requested of the district and we did submit that upon um, their request. And ultimately, the letter of finding and resolution agreement were received by us on August 31st, 2017. So that kind of breaks down um, the timeline um, for the complaint. There were two allegations um, that the letter outlines. The first allegation is related to the classroom space that was used by the Bridge Program students. This was for the 14, 15, and 15, 16 school years. Then we had allegation 2A and 2B, and this is just following the letter. Um, allegation 2A is the implementation of student A's IEPs, and allegation 2B is the implementation of student B's IEP. I'll go through each one of these because there are subparts to that. Um, I wanted to provide some context in terms of the bridge classroom and some timeline. So, um, going back to January 2011, the superintendent of schools had notified the school committee of elementary classroom and educational space concerns. Um, in May 2012, there was the locker study was completed to identify identifying elementary spaces needs in Reading, and they made some key recommendations around the space needs. During the spring and summer of 2013, space options were reviewed, including possible purchase of St. Agnes School. In the fall of 2013, the Early Childhood Center Working Group formed to review space needs that were district-wide. Um, in February of 2014, this is when we had our coordinated program review from the Massachusetts Department of Education. The team was on site. They were on site at Joshua Eaton, and there were no citations at that time regarding shared space at Joshua Eaton um, or concerns raised um, regarding other schools. I wasn't here at that time. That's just the finding from the Department of Education. In February 2014, the town meeting did not support the request for feasibility study for the Early Childhood Center. 
Um, in spring 2015, we had contracted with Walker Associates to complete a program evaluation. In that program evaluation, they indicated that there were recommendations regarding space, that there were concerns in particular at the elementary level regarding spaces for our students with disabilities. Um, in April 2015, the six modular classrooms were approved by town meeting. In July 2015, there was a new principal in place at Josh Wheaton. Um, it wasn't until October of 2015 that the two modular classrooms arrived at Joshua Eaton, which during that time when school had started, our kindergarten classrooms were sharing the gymnasium. Um, we had two kindergarten classrooms in the gymnasium for September and part of October until the modular classrooms arrived and then those students were transitioned to the modular classrooms. From September of 2015 to February of 2016, I engaged in conversations with the building principal, the superintendent, our facilities director regarding space options for special ed programs at Joshua Eaton. We did walkthroughs in buildings. We, we looked at different space options. Um, in spring 2016, we identified classroom spaces for the bridge classroom for the 16-17 school year that were dedicated spaces for the 2-3 classroom and the 4-5 classroom. And in August 2016, when students returned for the 16-17 school year, the bridge 2-3 and the 4-5 classrooms were dedicated spaces um, for the students in that program. So that just gives you a sense of kind of the overall <coughs> bigger picture of space needs. Um, so our OCR findings were on the bridge classroom space. As I said before, the findings are based on the setup of the classrooms during the 14, 15, and 15, 16 school years. Our bridge program services students with language-based learning disabilities. Those students are typically students with average to above average IQ with a significant discrepancy in their academic performance, either in the area of reading, writing, or math, or all three. Um, many of those students carry a diagnosis of dyslexia as well as other um, disabilities. So we, um, during the 2014-15 and 15-16 school year, the classrooms were set up where the bridge classroom and the learning center, which is where students come in and out, shared a common space. Um, and so this is what the um, Office for Civil Rights was looking at, is whether or not um, those individuals with disabilities were discriminated against because of the space. Um, if you have the letter in front of you, I have put up some of the page numbers. So um, in regards to the classroom size, um, OCR did not have a finding. They felt that it was comparable in square footage um, given the number of students in the program um, and the number of students who are in a, a general education setting. The concerns that really came up through the OCR findings is that the access to the hallways, that there wasn't direct access from the side of the room that the bridge students utilized. There wasn't direct access to the hallway, so those students had to walk through the learning center space. And OCR felt that this was a negative feature of the bridge program classroom. The other area of concern was classroom noise, that because there were two educational um, activities happening on either side and there wasn't a, a, a barrier that went to the ceiling, that the um, noise could have a negative impact. Um, and finally, there were concerns about privacy. Um, the, the OCR's finding is that the classroom structure was a negative feature of the bridge program classroom space which compromised the privacy of the bridge program students. That's on page five of the finding. The conclusion was that OCR found that the students in the bridge program classes were more likely than not adversely impacted by the shared classroom setup. It was inferior to other rooms because of lack of direct access to the hallway, no door, noise, and the noise concerns and privacy. So those were the findings on the, the space. Um, so um, for both of the specific student issues, there are some allegations that overlap. So I combined the three areas where both um, students had similar findings. So for both student A and student B, there were allegations of non-implementation of IEPs. The first allegation is for multi-sensory instruction. And so you can find information related to that on page 7, 8, 12, and 13. 
Ultimately, for both students, OCR found insufficient evidence to suggest the district failed to implement the multi-sensory instruction provisions of student A's and B's IEPs. So the finding was that we were implementing the multi-sensory instruction. The second allegation was the quiet and non-distracting learning environment. And again, that was an allegation that both complainants brought forward. Um, and in this one, given the concerns that I just shared regarding the shared space, um, OCR found the district more likely than not failed to fully implement the provisions of the student A and student B's IEPs related to providing a non-distracting learning environment because of the shared space that we just um, discussed in the first allegation. And finally, the, the third allegation that overlapped between both of the complainants was for movement breaks. Um, and OCR found insufficient evidence to suggest the district failed to implement the provision of student A's and student B's IEPs related to movement breaks. So they did find that it appeared from the documentation in our conversations that the students were provided with those um, accommodations as outlined in their IEPs. Um, so now I'm gonna go through the different allegations. There are, there are separate issues for each student. So student A, there were concerns and allegations of non-implementation of structured reading services. This can be found on pages eight and nine. Um, so from the start of the 2015 school year through October 13th, um, OCR found that there was insufficient evidence to suggest the district failed to implement. Again, stating that we were implementing um, the services as outlined in the IEP. The area of non-implementation came starting October 15th, 2015 through the end of the 15-16 school year, where the district did not take steps to ensure that it faithfully implemented the structured reading services in student A's IEP. Um, we were not, um, we failed to implement with a special ed teacher for the allotted time. Um, for that individual student. Um, there were times that a paraprofessional was providing um, services that were outlined in the IEP should have been a special education teacher. So there were two areas where we failed to properly implement student this student A's IEP, which was the structured reading with the special ed teacher from October of 2015, I believe, to the end of that school year. Um, and then the other area where we didn't implement was the distraction-free um, location in the classroom, which relates back to the design, the setup of those two classrooms. Um, and OCR determined as a result of those two um, areas not being implemented that student A's progress was negatively affected and the district's failure to implement these aspects of student A's IEP rose to a level of denial of fate a free appropriate public education. Um, so the additional allegations that were brought forth regarding student B, first um, was the use of Lexia during the school day. The student's IEP indicated that the student would not be utilizing Lexia during the school day. Um, and there was an IEP in effect from January 2016 to May 2016 that prohibited the use of Lexia. Um, and the teacher and paraprofessional were using Lexia during that time. So there was a failure to implement that um, accommodation. The second allegation is related to structured reading services. So uh, OCR first looked at the time period from January 2016 to May 24th, 2016. So on May 24th, 2016, the parent signed the IEP. So from January to May, um, OCR found that the reading services were being implemented as written on the IEP. Um, there were actually more services than written on the IEP were being provided um, during that time frame. From May 24th, 2016 to the end of the school year, which was June 21st, 2016, the, we had no documentation to show that the teacher had changed the schedule and that the increase in services were being provided for that time period. Um, and the final allegation for student B was that the um, district was not implementing the varied work locations or positions for the student. Um, in this instance, OCR found that there was insufficient evidence to suggest that we failed to implement the provisions 
uh, using a variety of work locations um, and or provisions. So for student B, um, the areas that we didn't properly implement as a district were the prohibition on Lexia, the, the structured reading with a special education teacher from May 25th to June 21st, and um, the decreased environmental and visual distractions when possible, which was related to the shared space. OCR again determined that it was more likely than not that student B's progress was negatively affected and the district's failure to implement these aspects of student A's or student B's IEPs rose to a level of denial of FAPE. Um, we, as is included in the packet, we have a resolution agreement with the Office for Civil Rights that we are committed to. Uh, the district were committed to taking these specific steps to address the areas of noncompliance. As long as we remain in compliance with this agreement, we are not at jeopardy to lose any federal funding um, because we have come to an agreement that satisfactorily resolves um, the complaint. Um, OCR will continue to monitor this. Um, as you'll see in this um, resolution agreement, there are certain dates that we need to provide reports to OCR, and we've already begun that process. Um, the OCR investigation has concluded. This is in their letter on page 17. And that they specifically say that this letter really represents conclusions of this individual case. So it really is representative of these specific um, allegations, this specific set of facts, that this isn't, should, shouldn't be representative of policy from the Office for Civil Rights, but that it really is representative of the facts of this case. Um, and as I stated, we've begun the implementation of the resolution agreement. We've notified those families that have been impacted by this. They've received a letter. We have started to receive some back as well um, regarding compensatory services. Um, in addition, I wanted to review a couple other action steps that we have taken. Um, during the summer, in regards to the bridge program, during the summer of 2015, we began consultation work with Landmark School, and we had teachers um, attending trainings offered through Landmark Outreach. Um, during September 2015, a change in practice that we made is beginning our um, professional learning communities that were vertical. So those were opportunities for all of our bridge program teachers to come together and really look at student progress from elementary to middle to high school. I think this was a really big step in aligning our program and improving our practice and having communication about student progress. Um, in October 2015, we talked about this, that the modular classrooms were added, so that added classroom space in the school. In October of 2016, we hired a full-time team chair for Joshua Eaton to really begin to monitor the compliance and really help supporting the needs at Joshua Eaton. Um, in November of last year, November of 2016, myself and Amy Benjamin, the new team chair, reviewed all service delivery grids and teacher schedules. And as a result of that, we came to you as a committee and said we needed an additional special education teacher for Joshua Eaton. We were able to hire a teacher in January of 2017, and that additional position has been in the budget um, for this school year. So really ensuring that all services can continue to be implemented. Um, in September, we, um, our new principal has reviewed all IEPs and service delivery grids um, and teacher schedules for the students in the bridge program and is really working to ensure that all those services are implemented as written in IEPs. Um, we also, in September 2017, for the 4-5 classroom, they received a brand new rug, um, so a real makeover in that classroom, which is exciting for them. And coming up in October, I will be meeting with the team chair and the principal to review IEPs and teacher schedules again to make sure that we are on track for full implementation of those. So. Are all the principals reviewing all the IEPs in the wake of this? That's really the goal. I can't say that everyone's doing that as of yet, but okay. this finding has been shared with all the team chairs. So have we, have we communicated that it, what strikes me about student A and student B situation is that some of these requirements were fairly objective. Don't use Lexia. Mm -hmm. um, use a SPED teacher, not a para. Mm -hmm. And it strikes me that a couple of the facts that are in your slides resulted from changes that occurred mid-year. Mm -hmm. And so what I want to make sure that we're communicating to our teams mm -hmm. 
is that changes that may seem or may have one significance for one student may have a different significance mm -hmm. for another. So there may be changes, changing staffing on a student that may be perfectly permitted for one student and for another student that's a violation of the law. Mm -hmm. And so what mechanism do we have to ensure that not only that principals and, and the right staff are not only looking at IEPs and making sure we're in compliance at the start of the year, but making sure that the relevant staff who are working with these students mm -hmm. know where the pressure points are for every student of what they cannot change. Mm -hmm. So I'd like some report back, and I have, I have two suggested dates mm -hmm. for that. Um, there's a November 1st mm -hmm. deadline for reporting to OCR. And there's an October 1st, 2018 deadline, and there's an April 1st, 2018 deadline. Those are the three dates I pulled out of that, mm -hmm. um, the memo in the, uh, in the packet. So the November 1st deadline is close to the November 10th deadline for mm -hmm. the MCR thing, so maybe we could do something in yeah. October. And then the October 18, those are still a ways off, right? Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I just want to make sure that we're not only compliant now, mm -hmm. but that we have the mechanism and the feedback loop in place because it, it's very difficult to track. You have hundreds of kids in mm -hmm. IEPs across the district, and we need to have a, a reliable mechanism and process in place. And as mm -hmm. you know, and it's just a question of helping us help you. Let us know mm -hmm. what you need for that, right? Mm -hmm. So part of the discussions yeah. we'll have is around budget and resources and understanding mm -hmm. how you know decisions that we collectively make about resourcing these schools impact our ability mm -hmm. to do exactly what we what mm -hmm. we have to do. Yeah. Thanks. I think, Nick, that's a, a great point about resourcing the schools, and I'm thinking back to one of your <coughs> um, previous questions and thinking about how, you know, last year when one of the things that we discussed that I think was really important was increasing our ability to um, support teachers in terms of um, coaching and observation and evaluation and ensure that, you know, we're, we're making progress and ensure that um, we're sort of able to communicate the processes, able to observe, and then able to communicate, mm -hmm. you know what, there's, this is the benchmark process now, you're almost there but not quite, mm -hmm. let's get it the rest of the way. And I do think that we, we, we looked at that, and I, I know that we all are looking for accountabilities, but I just feel like there's no one more accountable than us, and we, we, we have a job to do to um, make sure that the resources are there. These people are working way too hard. Um, and, and we need them to be working hard, but effective and in a very focused way. So I, I feel like, you know, I look at this, and we all lived through this timeline. Um, well, I shouldn't say that, sorry. That, um, that I, Nick, not recalling when you came on, but I know I've been back since 2014. Um, and I think, you know, we, we lived through the angst of this timeline and trying to, to get the things that we need for the district. And so, um, you know, and so we end up in a place that we did <coughs> not want to be, right? We, we ended up in a place we didn't want to be. I think there's been a lot of things put in place. I hope that the ESPED, you know, really does um, provide you with tools to do the job and enables you to serve students better and, and isn't something that, you know, take, takes up mm -hmm. so much time that that, that value equation mm -hmm. isn't what we need it to be. Um, but I, um, you know, I, I, I think we need to keep utilizing those tools. I, I have a question. Um, so in terms of the resolution, right, I just, did I, unless I missed it, I know there was a lot of communication out to parents mm -hmm. and for the um, number of students that were in the program at the mm -hmm. time that were sort of eligible um, to receive some services. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you could just comment sure. on that. Sure, briefly. there were 15 students identified who were eligible for services through the resolution agreement. So if a student was enrolled in the program for two years, they're eligible for 30 hours of compensatory services. That could be in the area of reading, specialized reading, math, or a combination thereof. If a student was enrolled um, in the program for one year, they're eligible for 15 hours of compensatory services. So all the families have received 
Um, that letter went out on September 15th. Additionally, I did call each of the families um, to let them know that a copy of the um, redacted letter of finding and resolution agreement would be available for pickup prior to it going out in the school committee packet. If I wasn't able to reach a parent and talk with them personally, I also I followed up with an email to share that information with them. So I've had the opportunity in some form, either electronically or um, voice contact, to speak with each of the families impacted um, by this. So it, it's hard as we'll all try. I mean, there is no guarantee of, of more financial resources. Is, is you know, if... Is there anything in peril here within the within the means that we have now that that we can't do because of <coughs> budgetary constraints? As of right now, in regards to this, we um, no longer are out of compliance on it from a space perspective. Um, that issue has been resolved. And as I said, we added um, an additional special education teacher at Joshua Eaton. So at this time. We never know, as you know, students move in, students are found eligible throughout the school year, so those needs may change. Um, unfortunately, what we do in special education is not static. It changes day to day, and so we'll continue to monitor that. But as of today, we feel comfortable that IEPs are being implemented and that the space issues are 100% resolved with dedicated spaces for both the two, three, and the four, five. And those issues had been resolved prior to OCR coming on site during the 16-17 um, school year. So when OCR came on site for observation, we had already committed to making that change. So they didn't actually have an opportunity to observe the shared space. Okay. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. uh, just a quick comment and uh, request. The, the issue of an IEP not being completely 100% in compliance obviously is deeply concerning mm -hmm. for, for I imagine for everybody so it's problematic on a number of levels one mm -hmm. is the liability to the community mm -hmm. and to the school district the other is what happens to the relationship between mm -hmm. the family and the schools when that happens um, which I think can often be very difficult if not impossible to repair so at some point soon I would certainly like to loop back as a committee and get kind of a deep dive on what we're, and we touched on it tonight mm -hmm. in a couple of the other findings, but a real deep dive on how are we ensuring 100% compliance across the district. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to make that request. I think the other piece just to add to that is the impact on the student. Exactly. And I don't want to lose any sight of yeah. the impact on our students and their ability to make progress when, when we fail to implement um, as the IEPs are written. Mm -hmm. Can you just, just one second? Oh, okay. Thanks. Ms. West. I, um, you know, you talked about will today. You're looking at it today at this point in time, and I think it's not a static. Um, it's not a static situation. Mm -hmm. Yet, you know, once we set um, pass a budget for the year, that's the number that we have, and we traditionally have not um, gone back uh, to um, FinCom or or mm -hmm. town meeting um, for additional funds. For changes, mm -hmm. um, you know, some on some sides, the municipal services may, after a time, go back, um, you know, over time. Mm -hmm. um, for instance, is um, an area where they may go back at the after the end of the year. We have, we have not done that because we are always looking to try to absorb. And I, I just think, obviously, we have a lot of challenges. So mm -hmm. I can, I really, uh, I mm -hmm. appreciate that you're cautioning, you're, mm -hmm. you're giving an answer mm -hmm. for today. Right. And I think a lot of us in the room are thinking about mm -hmm. tomorrow and next week mm -hmm. and uh, the, our budget process mm -hmm. that's coming up. And that that's yeah. making me feel pretty uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have a, just a question. The um, In terms of OCR, they collected all this information. I just want to make mm -hmm. sure I understand. So the they were trying to collect information about um, two school years, but mm -hmm. they were basically after that time, they never actually saw the physical mm -hmm. setup. Mm -hmm. They collected the data through two site visits, two days. I think they were on site one day. One day. And then some follow-up phone through, interviews. So it was, it was one day, again, <coughs> not seeing that, and then mm -hmm. it was documentation and mm -hmm. interviews. And, and interviews, phone interviews. Yeah. interviews, yeah. And in-person interviews? Yeah. Yeah. So yes, we had in-person in interviews. So well. I appreciate all of our staff who um, mm -hmm. probably that was fairly stressful 
Um, I, I don't know if any of the staff in the room um, needed to participate in that, mm -hmm. but um, that is a very stressful um, mm -hmm. situation and event, mm -hmm. and I know that teachers probably like mm -hmm. to spend 98% of their time mm -hmm. focused on the students, mm -hmm. which is what gives you the reward, <coughs> why on earth you do this mm -hmm. job. Um, so answering interviews and sort of mm -hmm. feeling like you're being deposed mm -hmm. is difficult. Mm -hmm. I appreciate all that people have gone through. I just wanted to, and it, it overlaps with um, what's been said before, but I remember I had just come on the school committee and had been following, but had I uh, had been following the space issues for a long time, and I remember the deliberations around, okay, the early childhood center had failed, now what do we do? And the modulars weren't yet quite there, we had to start ed educating the community about that. And I remember the conversations trying to figure out how do we give the space that's necessary. And everything felt like a, the best we could do with the funding that we had. And it's so unfortunate that there were that the walls couldn't go up to the ceiling, that the quiet couldn't be enforced, that um, there was a gap between the hallway. And I, I guess I'm going to a place where I hope that we're not cornered because it doesn't work out to be less expensive for the town when we can't provide the space or the services mm -hmm. as they need to be. And the cost for our teachers and our families and our students and the turnover and and mm -hmm. the pain mm -hmm. for everyone it's um, the compromises don't work mm -hmm. I mean, we need to be able to provide our budget needs to be able to provide for what our students need in their IEPs and that's law mm -hmm. it's not wiggle room on that is there a question or is that no, it was actually um, I just, mm -hmm. just how hard it is. Thank mm -hmm. you. I'm sorry. Thank you for your patience. Mm -hmm. Did Maybe we should have another meeting about this subject. <laughs> you, um, can you come up to the mic, though, if you're going to I speak? just have a um, question. Wouldn't it stand to reason if those two students... Could you students please... It's really important that people at home get to hear. Wouldn't it stand to reason if those two students didn't receive all their structured reading services on the same grid that all the other kids were in the classroom, that they, all the other kids didn't get their services as well? That's not our understanding of the situation. But I'm happy to look into it more if you have specific questions. Yeah. And my other question is, why, I, I guess what most of the parents were concerned about is that the school committee knew that this was an issue because there was a letter written to the school committee in 2014 about this classroom situation and my son was greatly impacted by this and nothing was done then the Walker report came out and nothing was done and I understand you're talking about budget and all that but budget can, it could be figured out in a different way uh, when you have kids that are trying to receive their basic core academics you could take it out of the, God forbid, the middle school foreign language course instead. I mean, the, these kids, it, it, people are really frustrated by this. And um, it's, we feel like you knew about it and didn't help. Um, and it's upsetting. So I guess I'm, I don't know if I'm just asking a question or I guess I am. Why wasn't, why wasn't it taken more seriously? Can, can I make a So in, um, 99, between 1999 and 2003, when we were in very similar, um, actually though I think this year is going to be worse, but very similar financial situation. One of the things that was happening in the district at the time, and the superintendent was not Dr. Darty, and it was not the late Patrick Scatini, one of the things that was happening in the district at the time is that the superintendent was offering as a solution uh, to pit sort of the regular day services against the special education. 
And I can tell you it was really a horrible time because parents ended up being sort of pitted against parents. And so I understand that we need to provide basic education services for students. And some students have an IEP. Other students do not have an IEP, but they are entitled to basic education services. And it's our job to balance that. And I think it was acknowledged that we were not able to do uh, as good a job as we would like to. Um, and space, when we run up against space issues, those can be, those are the hardest to solve because you can't fix a space issue by um, going back to uh, the FinCom and saying we need another $50,000 for, ha for uh, a teacher or another $25,000 for half of a teacher. Not that we do that, but we, you could do that theoretically. We can't do that for space. It takes a little bit more time. It takes approval of town meeting. So yeah, it was a struggle. And I think everyone in this room tries to do the very best they can. We need to do better. We did a poor job, evidently, last year trying to convince the community of just what kind of situation we're in and what we need. But I, under no circumstances, want to divide our community the way it was in 99 before the override passed. And it was very, it was very divided. Special education parents were at complete odds with regular day. You're taking services from my kids. Well, my kids have an IEP. It was horrible. We're not going there. We need to provide education services for all children to the best extent we can. I think we also felt that the, um, the ending of the, the kindergarten lottery had a lot to do with it, too, because then you mm -hmm. needed more space for that. Um, it, it's just. Now we feel we're, we're at odds with the school committee at this point. I mean, there's a lot of frustration. And you almost need another meeting about this LD program. We, I, I mean, you know, there is, uh, we feel the program is just not where it should be. And the letter that I had from a group of um, parents of dyslexic, in the end we were suggesting a task force be put together. There's really, in the, in the letter that I had asked for in the packet about the um, improvements at Josh Wheaton, um, none of that talked about the LLD program. Nothing. And it, and it missed the package, or it was supposed to be in the package. It's in the it packet. Went, it, was, you know, it was put, it was put in. Late. Um, the emails. The emails was, were put in tonight. So there's really, mm -hmm. they offered tutoring to the vulnerable, to, the, to, the, to those that vulnerable readers, and they didn't include the so LLD children. It, it was, we, I, I'm not sure if this, and I, and you know, I know I'm spouting and I'm not, but it's just to, just to show you that that's the general feeling and that I think there needs to be a bigger forum and the last five minutes of this forum is not going to cut it. Why, we are not out of time. I, I, we're, we're definitely not out of time, but um, I, the special education PAC or uh, Parent Advisory Council, one of the roles of the PAC is to advise the school committee. So I don't know if this topic that you're talking about, I'm not the liaison, you know, Linda has been there, um, has been, is one of the items that is being taken up to work with Carolyn and bring to, bring to us in some manner. Uh, so I, I, you know, There's maybe that's a good opportunity. That's, yeah, the CPAC we've had issues with that as well. It's just not, I think we need a separate meeting about the LD. It's just not, it, w w we seem to go unheard. What, what are, do we, not, do we not want to address that now because it's not relevant to, to the OCR and we want to close that or do we, can we hear people who are here to speak about it? Yes. So I think people can speak about it. Do you want, actually. The, the, only, the only caution is we can't yeah. talk about students. students. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It might help if I read the letter that this is from a group of yes, parents of dyslexics. Mm -hmm. And uh, I apologize, I'm not a very good public speaker, so bear with me. Um, we are speaking to the Reading Public School Administrators and School Committee Board members as parents of children with dyslexia. Children who have struggled, been bullied, witnessed bullying, and or have been denied effective progress, discriminated against, and had their civil rights violated. Parents just like us, been constructively criticizing how RPS educates and identifies our children, or lack thereof, since the early 2000s. 
Uh, children's disabilities are invisible, but they are real, and they need, to, they need equality. We understand that there are many different learning disabilities and health issues that qualify a child for special education. We also care about those students, but for tonight we speak specifically about the children in this district excuse me, with language-based learning disability. It's the largest percentage of children who comprise IEPs and 504s. It's also the group of students who need to be who need to be early identified and provided intensive re mediation based on science. Science tells us if our children get appropriate intensive reading instruction taught with fidelity in the younger elementary school years, their brains will actually change and respond. If you wait or provide subpar or incorrect remediation, they lose the crucial time and will require more extensive instruction repeated for years. Their social emotional, emotional health plummets and they fall further and further behind in all subjects area across the curriculum thus significantly increasing the cost needed to properly educate these children. It has taken the Federal Office of Civil Rights to investigate and find RPS violated and discriminated against, discriminated against a group of children for you to finally listen, or at least we hope you're finally listening because these are our children. These are our youngest residents of Reading, children who are placed in the bridge pro program are likely removed from their neighborhood schools, away from their siblings, their friends, and their neighbors, and everything they know because their parents are told they would receive an intensive reading remediation in a quiet environment with few distractions. <coughs> OCR's investigation proved otherwise and determined that FAPE was denied. It is reasonable to assume that if two bridge students structured reading was not provided, when, then all of the bridge students structured reading was not provided correctly. This has happened year after year. We, we have schedules and IEP service de delivery grids to prove it. As the Walker Report stated in 2014, the students are forced to fit the program and, and the OCR confirmed this. With that being said, these kids don't need a tiered system of support or the wait for, to fail approach. They don't need RPS telling their parents that they will catch up in time or given the wrong interventions until they fail. And what about the other students with dyslexia who, whose disability is acknowledged by RPS but are not placed in the bridge and not typical enough to access grade level material in the neighborhood schools? These kids also need intensive structured reading designed for those with dyslexia and taught with fidelity. Instead, they are giving a wrong interventions in the same way to fail approach. The one thing that all parents of children with dyslexia have in common is this district is watching their children live in educational purgatory. It's a space between RPS not identifying or providing an explicit multi-sensory program or intensive phenomic awareness program taught with fidelity in RPS not placing these children in appropriate educational programs. Educational purgatory is where parents often witness their children fall apart, develop anxiety, school avoidance, visit the nurse with somatic complaints, and tell them they are stupid and refuse to do their <coughs> work. It's the place where your above average intelligent fourth and fifth grader is child is reading fly guy and frustrated. It's the place where parents become that angry parent who keeps emailing the district and bringing their advocate to meetings. It's where they shell out thousands of dollars to bring educational spe specialists to team meetings to be scoffed at until their PhD level knowledge is wrong. Statistics show a direct correlation between reading impairment and decline of self-esteem leading to alcohol, drug use in high school or dropping out. Approximately 70 to 80 percent of prison population can't read proficiently. When our schools don't get the educational services they are required to get by law, parents must fight the statistics. How? They refinance their homes, cash in their retirement, or work extra jobs to pay legal fees, neuropsych reports, observations, private tutors, and private school tuition. They bring their children to tutors or therapists after a long day at school and where they are exhausted. If they can't afford to do those things, they sit along their children in educational purgatory. The entire family feels the struggle. Parents who can afford to are forced to get their children out of district. Our children deserve to be educated in town with their peers. They deserve to get an education at their home schools in the least restricted, restrictive environment. There is no reason why this can't happen. <coughs> How can RPS change and fulfill its legal and ethical responsibilities while also taking limited resources into account? We propose a school committee establish a language-based learning disability task force. The task force should consist of Carolyn Wilson, principals of the schools with bridge programs, RISE director, a school psychologist experienced in learning profiles of students with, with <coughs> dyslexia, past parents, 
of LLD children, current parents of Bridge Program students, a representative from, from each of the levels of school familiar with general ed curriculum, and a representative of each of the levels of school familiar with the special education for students with dyslexia, preferably Orton-Gillingham certified. This task force needs to develop a blueprint for objective data for the bridge program as recommended by the Walker Report. This task force should report to the school committee and always include a parent while meeting. There are dozens of private there are dozens of private observations of students with dys dyslexia that can be redacted and reviewed by the tax task force. There are basic lines of communication that need to be developed and there are staffing needs that should be determined. This task force is free and will consist of mem members already in RPS. And it's time to, to do what's finally right. And that is um, the view of quite a few of parents in this town. Thank you. We'll uh, discuss. And we're, um, and it's exhausting. Do we have a copy of the letter? I'm sorry. Do we have a copy of the letter? Can we get a copy? Yeah, we, we'll need a copy of the letter. Yeah. Can you, did you sign the public input sheet? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for you. That's right. We'll make copies of that. Are there? Well, we can put it in the next packet also. Can I just add one thing to that? Can you I'm, do you mind coming up, please? Thank you. And I know, oh, Miss Alicia, did you have? I just want to thank Lauren because that was awesome that she came yeah. up here and did that for all the kids in this town that have dyslexia. Um, I, what I really think the task force needs to do as well is the walk report said we need entrance and exit criteria for the bridge program. We need that to happen because that is why education purgatory happens in this town. Because parents and the teachers, we have no guidance to know how to interpret data and what we should be doing for these kids and when we can remediate them and move them on, whether that's out of district or whether that's back to the home school where they belong with their friends and family. That's all I want to add. Thank you. I'm really, I am very sad to hear uh, that we provide education purgatory, but I would sort of, I don't know what that means. It's going to become a sound bite, and I just, I don't really, I, I really would like a little bit of, of I think, I think, just, it, if it's, yeah, I, I don't, I, I mean, if it's, if things that we've talked about in terms of, you know, students maybe not making progress, but I mean, students struggle, all of our students, we're all parents here, we have times, places where students struggle. I would hope that when that struggle happens, we can communicate well enough and get things moving in a more <coughs> positive direction and, and you don't stay in a stuck place. I don't quite understand why this hasn't been part of the CPAC. I'm sort of missing that. If maybe you're uh, Carolyn, Carolyn and I have had, um, Alicia Williams, I'm one of the CPAC co-chairs and I can't speak for the CPAC as you know because we haven't, we're not in quorum, but I can say that Carolyn and I have spent many hours talking about it. We've spent, um, we've, tried to come up with plans. We've worked on the reading specialist at the high school. Um, so I mean, I've done from the CPAC standpoint, I've done what I can. My son's not dyslexic, so I had to sort of learn what needed to happen with the dyslexia program. And it's a very slow process for myself to learn. There's a big learning curve. And um, with the parents on the PAC, I, I tried my best to do what we could. And we did stay on it. I really feel like I really did stay on top of it. So um, with that said, I am here tonight to express my utter disbelief both as a parent and as one of the three CPAC co-chairs. While I am on the CPAC board, I speak tonight as a parent. At a time when people regularly spout hate and discrimination, our very own special education students were the unnecessary victims of discrimination that was first made known to Reading in the 2015 Walker Report. My son is one of those students who was placed in a classroom that was divided by partitions and had students from multiple grades and learning levels. My husband and I did not join the complainants. 
Just what? be careful with naming oh. students. Sorry. You can't talk about even if it's your own child. You can't talk about it. Okay. In public session. Okay. Thank you. Um, but the voters of Reading and the citizens of Reading should know that there's a larger audience of children that were affected. I'm still waiting for the response from the school committee and the Human Relations Advisory Committee as to what has happened to our own students. This discrimination is no different from that due to gender, nation, national, or, national origin, or religious affiliation. Reading failed to observe the civil rights of our children and was aware of these deficiencies. And over that ensuing time, the schools seemingly, seemingly did nothing to correct it. Not once was I made aware of any attempt to fix a classroom. Why were the deficiencies identified in the Walker Report not addressed prior to the complaint, in, be, the complaint being filed to the Office of Civil Rights? By my account, these violations went on for two years. It's unacceptable that the Reading Public Schools chose to address problems only at the point that compliance failures are noted by state or federal agencies. In the 2015 Walker Report, pages 28, 29, and 36 detail a series of deficiencies, which ironically are the ones noted by the OCR complaint. On page 28, it states, many program spaces and classrooms across the district were either too small or partitioned off and located in less than desirable locations. It also states that many recommendations from previous special evaluation reports remain in need of actions. On page 29, it states, the district is lacking in professional development program that addresses how general ed staff members assume ownership of student IEPs. Again, another violation cited in the report. And on page 36, the comments were made, program space is lacking in some schools and the location of some classes is less than desirable. Special education programs should be provided in classrooms that are equal in scope and size to general education classrooms. Areas of special education deficiencies need to be addressed. It can no longer wait. How many more violations are out there where parents address areas that need to be fixed but have no other option but to file with PQA or OCR? The new DES DESI mid-cycle review tonight shows deficiencies in basic IEP deliverables, the legal document that dictates our child's education plan. In closing, I'd like the school committee to take a look at any reports that Reading has done, whether voluntary or involuntary. There needs to be a running list with action items. The special education community relies on issues raised in these reports, and they need to be addressed in a timely fashion. We all need to do better. These are our children. Thank you. Thank you. with special ed I have um, older children not going to get and I've never had an issue I've always had a great uh, my IEPs have always I've never had a problem until I had a dyslexic um, which is a whole different ball game and so it's almost like you're sitting in this he's sitting in this place where you're not your your child is not getting the correct services to have them progress and you're sitting there with this two-year gap and when you have a child when you and I have to say it's really um, with dyslexics when you have a child that um, uh, starts out young and doesn't get their correct remediation they're, they're already behind and then they wait for them to fail so that then it creates this gap usually around a two-year gap in addition to what they're already feeling already how they're already behind so then you try to catch up the teachers try to catch up, they work so hard, and then they really don't have the sources to give them the one-to-one -on -one attention. The school doesn't have the sources, so everybody just sits there and waits for it to get better and waits for the gap to get close, and it never happens. So it's this cycle of not getting the correct remediation, and yes, we're giving him according to our, according to what we feel is good for dyslexic, we're giving you the correct remediation. So it's this constant push and pull of what's going on. Um, so then you sit, you're sitting in this purgatory. That's what it's, it feels like because there's nothing moving forward and there's nothing getting done. So unless you have the funds to get your child out of district or to really fight, you just sit. So the best thing for you to do is, I know if you really want to look into it, um, I know a bunch of parents who have had evaluations done of the LD programs in this town. Um, through people that are much 
more highly educated than us um, in the field, neuropsych, and that's been given to the district. You can check that out and see what they say. Those would be the most telling things for you to really evaluate what the L what's going on with the LLD and where it's lacking, where it should be. Because um, it's, it's an issue. And it's not just, and I'm not, I was never an angry sped parent before. I have two other children that have successfully gone through the school. It's really in with the LLD. With the, and you know, I'm not blaming teachers. My son's teach, fifth grade teacher worked so hard to try to, and I told her myself, she inherited a big bag of crap and I, and she really worked hard. And she just, it just, it's just too far behind for her. So I encourage you to ask for those documents and that will help you understand because I know you don't understand, you can't unless you have a dyslexic in the system. So um, if you look at those documents, it I think will help you. Thank you. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Melissa Pucci. I have three children in the Reading School System and I've been a Reading resident for over 20 years. Um, I have a statement but also a question. It's not directly related to the LLD program, but it is somewhat, re it's related to the space issue. Um, so bear with me. If it's not appropriate, you could stop me, but this is my question. <laughs> um, when the Connections program was located at the Barrows Elementary School, then called the DLC program, there was a change made in the model of the program to a co-teaching method. At that time, the designated DLC classroom was changed to a full-day kindergarten classroom. When the students in the DLC program were to receive direct teaching outside of the regular educational classroom, it was being done in the hallway, the library, the corner of the regu regular education the corner of the regular education classroom, or wherever the, the teacher could find a quiet space. Now that the program has moved to Birch Meadow. Does the program have a designated room for direct teaching to be done outside of the classroom? I feel it's relevant because part of the, the OCR complaint concern is a space mm -hmm. issue and providing equal access. So my question is, again, um, does that program have a designated room for direct teaching outside of the classroom? The Connections Program at Birch Meadows. Yes. Um, I don't believe they have one dedicated classroom for the Connections program because they utilize shared space. When those students need instruction, they may go to the Learning Center for that instruction because that's in a full inclusion program. For the students in our Compass program, we have two substantially separate classrooms dedicated right. for that. But because the Connections program is a full inclusion program, the students in that program may get pulled out for speech, where they go to the speech room, they may go to the OT space, and if they need to work with a special education teacher, they may access the learning center space. So the kids in the Connection program, when they need direct teaching, they are not, there's no direct room for the Connection no, program. No, there's not a separate space for that. But they do access the learning center. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure why that wasn't being done at Barrows mm -hmm. and why students were being mm -hmm. taught in the hallways mm -hmm. and in the library. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> but it was being done. Mm -hmm. um, my second question, and I'm not sure if that's part of an OCR mm -hmm. regulation too, if that's mm -hmm. even, a, is that an appropriate? Well, I think that's why I did state that the OCR finding is not that we can't have shared spaces. Right. There were particular concerns and violations that were brought forward with this fact pattern mm -hmm. as we discussed, which was the, the lack of a door, the, the inability to access the hallway, and the privacy concern because of the fact pattern here. So. I, I don't want to, you know, interpret that to mean that, that you know, mm -hmm. that's a violation. I think we'd have to look at each individual case. Sure. I have a second question. Mm -hmm. um, two years ago, um, the Connections Program at Coolidge had a shared classroom for ELA and math mm -hmm. that was divided by rolling chalkboards. Is this still the same setup, and are there any general education classrooms that also have this setup? <coughs> that have a shared. I don't believe we have any general education no. settings that have a shared no. space. Is it still the same setup in the Connections to, program at Coolidge for that math that. and ELA where they have a shared classroom with a chalkboard dividing the two classrooms? I'll have to look and see if that's how they've scheduled the students. I don't have their schedule right now. Okay. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, 
Hi, my name is Sarah McLaughlin. I know some of you, but I'm a mom of two daughters at Barrows, one of which uh, does have dyslexia. I have a question, and then I have two requests of the school committee, if I could. Um, Ms. Wilson, you had mentioned there were some landmark trainings, I believe, mm -hmm. the previous summer, <coughs> and you mentioned they were for the bridge staff. Was it specific to just the bridge staff, or was that also for other Wilson teachers within um, the district? Right now, the priority has been the bridge program, so Landmark um, has worked with both our general educators mm -hmm. and our special educators in the bridge program around teaching students with language-based learning disabilities, so really about programmatic. So is there a plan to expand that to other teachers that are providing um, reading pro specific reading programs such as Wilson to other kids in the district? So Wilson is a little different than what Landmark has been providing our teachers. Mm -hmm. um, Landmark really focuses on the methodology that we're providing in both the general education setting and in our bridge program classrooms. So they're not teaching our teachers about specialized reading. They're talking about how to work with a student with dyslexia or a language-based learning disability within the content and within that general education setting. So some of our general educators have been, and I know at Parker, they've been very involved mm -hmm. in that training, um, but it's not necessarily enhancing the Wilson okay. um, reading piece. It would be great to see that expanded to mm -hmm. other general education mm -hmm. settings given how many students uh, mm -hmm. with language-based learning disabilities mm -hmm. are not at Bridge mm -hmm. and are enrolled at the other elementary schools. So. My two requests are, we've talked a lot about Bridge and the LLD program at Joshua Eaton, but we know that 41% of the IEPs in this town are for students with specific learning disabilities. So obviously many of those kids are not enrolled at the Bridge program. So I'd like to request that the school committee, that we all as a community take a look at uh, our specific programs, but also how we're providing services to other kids not enrolled in those programs. So what we are, and more importantly, what we're not doing for those children. I think we've talked a lot about uh, the general feeling of parents, um, their kids aren't getting really what they need to progress, and that's not an experience that's specific just to Bridge. Right. Uh, the second request I'd like to make to the school committee is that we really develop a, a specific call to action for the administration, including a time frame, frequent communications and readouts to the community at large. I think a lot of people have questions uh, that they don't feel that they get answers to. And sometimes I think it's okay to say, we don't know the answer yet. We need to do more research. We need to look at our data. But we will follow up with you on a regular basis to provide what we can. And I think most importantly, we need to look at what data we have, but also what data don't we have? What don't we know? What do we need to know to make a plan? And then measure our progress around specific measurable goals. I think that seems to be what's lacking and, and the things that would maybe provide answers to parents. Thank, Thank you. you. So can you put up the timeline, the Bridge Program Classroom Timeline slide, please? Because mm -hmm. I feel like um, when I looked at that, a couple of things jumped out at me that are, are maybe more related to two aspects of the OCR complaint. And Lauren alluded to this, and when she mentioned task force, it kind of brought, brought it back to me. So after May 2012, around that time, and this is why she talked about the lottery, for those on the school committee who don't know this, that was the time the decision was made to get rid of the full day K lottery. That's not true. No? We haven't had a lottery in the nine years I've been superintendent. <coughs> My son was here in, in kindergarten in 2010, and there was a lottery that year. We've not had a lottery. I mean, okay. Yeah. And well, I, I'm just saying we've not had a lottery. I mean, I think we said we were going to have a lottery, but I don't think we ever had to have a lottery. Well, when I I went to a, I, I know my kids. I my when. I I guess maybe there's a dispute of that, but I know that in 2012. I was planning on putting my daughter in the lottery. I went to this, um, you know, get your child ready for kindergarten presentation by Mrs. Manor and Mrs. Carrigal, and Mrs. Manor told me in February 2012, oh, there's not going to be a lottery this year. And I was very excited and shared that with a lot of parents. And I don't know if that was the influence. I wasn't really on Facebook then, so. Um, but there was four kindergarten classes at Joshua Eaton that, that year. I think, though, that that was a decision it, it, that kind of led to the need for a lot of recognition. People want the kindergarten space, led to interest in it, but it was not a mandatory thing, even as we all liked it, if there was not legally required space for our special education programs, as sad as it sounds, you have to go back to a lottery. And we, I know we almost did that, 
when until we got the modulars. That was just one point. But the other point that I didn't see on the timeline, and it isn't really a classroom thing, but it's a special ed, I feel like it's a canary in the coal mine that could have indicated problems with IEPs not being followed. And that was in September 2014 when Joshua Eaton was put into level three. And it was put into level three for a couple of reasons, but I think the biggest one was the performance of the high need students, most of which are special ed students. And when Lauren talked about forming a task force, I was on the Joshua Eaton task force at that time. And when we were investigating the issues, along with some other parents, and never once did we ever get to, even though we, we were put down, I'm looking at my notes here, the Mass DESE called us needs technical assistance for the performance <coughs> of our special ed students. Not once did that task force have Mrs. Wilson in to talk to us about what changes were made. I have an email I sent to the task force as we were ending on June 15, 2005. This is my email, so I, I'm going to read part of it. We were talking about what we're going to do at our final meeting. <coughs> What? You said 2005. I'm sorry, 2015. Two, June 15, 2015. And we're all talking about what do we want. I would like to hear, preferably at this task force meeting, an update on what, if anything, Carolyn Wilson learned during her audit or analysis of the special education and our high needs program. This is at Eaton. Especially any issues or practices that may have contributed, at least in part, to the very poor performance of high needs slash special education students at Joshua Eaton as compared to high needs peers in the state. We must not forget that fourth grade math and student growth was not the only reason that Joshua Eaton fell to level three. Our special education student performance and student growth also was in the bottom 20% of the state. Joshua Eaton is specifically classified by the Mass DESE as quote, needs technical assistance for special education. What has arisen from that? I had asked several times during the past seven months about what we were gonna learn about this aspect of Joshua Eaton's accountability and to my best recollection, the task force has never received any information from Carolyn Wilson or any other person <coughs> about what, if anything, was learned about high needs and or special education at Joshua Eaton and what is being done to ensure that these children have growth comparable to the peers in other special education classes in Reading and in the state. I am unclear about how the task force or anyone in Reading Public Schools can be confident that Joshua Eaton is on track to come out of level three unless the special education slash high needs issues also are resolved. And I feel like may maybe had we had the chance on that task force to look into that, possibly we could have detected or, or just heard, heard more about some is issues if IEPs were not being followed or the, the space that was there was causing problems with students, student performance. I can't speculate that that was the reason, but this is, this is also still looming in the background. These special ed students, you know, we'll see what the MCAS data says in, in a month from now. But this is still an issue, and I hope if you do form a task force, as Mrs. Bennett suggests, that you also look into this lingering issue that our task force was never able to resolve. Thank you. Dr. Doherty. There's just, uh, just a couple of things. Um, and I've presented on space since January of 2011 to this committee. Um, there are competing priorities that contributed to our space shortage. One of them is that we grew the number of special education programs in this district. We went from one to eight or nine now. Those all require space. So the full day kindergarten certainly has contributed to that, but so hasn't our increase in special education programs because we felt it was the right thing to do for kids, to have them in district. So there are several things that contributed to the space issue. But the full day Not, kindergarten. No, job. the full day kindergarten was one piece. Right. The number of special education programs that were increased at the elementary level significantly contributed also. So there was two competing things. So I and let's talk about the research about full day kindergarten and the benefit that that has for kids, which also leads to the fact that we would have less students require special education services if they get full day kindergarten. So there's there's competing priorities here. I understand we, we can't that. just put the blame on the fact that we have increased full-day kindergarten. It's not solely, but the thing is that's not a, a legal requirement, whereas... But, but we have increased is. programs in this district significantly during the time that I've been here and Mrs. Wilson's been here. Yeah, and I think
think that's so thing. that's also contributing to the space issue. It's not just full day kindergarten. The the other thing that I don't want to dismiss, and I don't know, Carolyn, if you can go back or ahead. Mm -hmm. A lot of what's been discussed tonight, I'm not disputing it at all, not disputing it at all, is what was done in the past. But I think if you see, and I think it's the slide that you show the things that have been happening, there is a lot that has been happening in the last two years to improve special education, primarily at Joshua Eaton, but in other places in the district as well. Some of it has been relieved by space when we got the six modular classrooms. But others has been the work that Mrs. Wilson has done to train teachers, to add staff. I mean, we're adding staff. Last year, we added staff, and it was not in the budget because it was the right thing to do. And we took a lot of heat from the community for doing that during the budget process. So we are trying to do what, and we're not perfect at this. We absolutely know what we have. You can see the work that. Mrs. Wilson and her staff has been doing since 2015. This is before the OCR complaint was made. We started the Walker Report. M Mrs. Wilson has come to this committee and has given you regular updates on the Walker Report. Some of it is resource constricted and we've not been able to do as much as we wanted to do. So the, I, the complaints you're hearing tonight, and they're very valid, are things that did happen in in the past, and we are working to rectify those. They're not happening as quickly as we all want, but we are doing everything we can do. And we continue to welcome that feedback and input. Mm -hmm. can I, can I say um, I appreciate that, and I know all the parents expressed a lot of concern about the space issue. Um, I think that you know, we have to Our PLCs have been working on that, and they do have those guidelines as they discuss them at the IEP teams. Okay, so has it been we haven't published them because they're guidelines, but if that's something, you know, I'm sure when they meet, they'll be meeting in October and reviewing them, and we can <coughs> put a document up on the website. Vertically, talking about it. Mm -hmm. So they're guidelines, so I'm happy to include that as guidelines for the teams to consider. Um, you know, we have to be cautious with things like ex exit and entrance because decisions about students' placement and services are made by IEP teams based on that individual student. And so when we create these documents, they're considered guidelines for our teams to consider in making determinations. But as was mentioned by someone in regards to the Walker Report, that students' individual needs need to be met. They can't be made to fit into a program. And so we want to ensure that teams are using that as guidelines. So we're always very cautious about how that is put out there. But each of our programs actually has been doing that work along with our related service providers in the vertical PLC work they're doing. Thank you. Okay, so for Ms. Webb then. Oh, no, I think it was. It was basically. Oh. Um, I just wanted to say that Having been at the CPAC meetings, I've actually heard Mrs. Wilson talking about very honestly what has been done, what's trying to be done, what the trajectory is, and why some things haven't been happening as fast as is desired, but acknowledging what is desired. Um, and so I actually have felt like there's been a real transparency and honesty and a shared frustration that some of the things can't happen faster because there is the real, um, the understanding that with each delay, with each not being able to be perfect for the teachers as well as Ms. Wilson from what I've heard is that we, there's the knowledge that individual kids are impacted and no one likes that. I don't think, I think, 
and, and like was said, I'm not contesting the purgatory that is experienced or felt. Um, but I've also seen a real transparency about what is being tried and where people are trying to go. And there might be, um, there are other things we can do, but I don't think that it's for lack of trying or caring. Um, I think we're dealing with human beings here and the impact on our kids and our families is very real, but so is the, the, the challenges. Um, and I, again, think that the CPAC has been trying to broach these. Um, Alicia talked about how much time she spent with Carolyn, and we're talking about people without assistance who do their own copying that have these time demands that, and yet it's still done. And so, again, it doesn't solve the issue, but I don't think it's for lack of trying, lack of caring. I know it isn't. Ms. Um, Williams. I just wanted to say really quickly that I don't want to begrudge any of the work that um, has been done. <coughs> Carolyn and I have worked really well together, I think, and we, we, I feel like we've accomplished a lot. One of the things that I didn't want to get kind of lost in what I said was in regards to the OCR violation that was out there, I really want to make sure for the students in our district, I don't want to be on the front page of the paper. I don't want, I love Reading. I don't want to see us on the front page of the paper. And I really, truly want the school committee to, to really drill down, dig down, and look. Here are the things that we're deficient in. Look to, and make sure we're not in violation, that somebody, some parent has said 16 times, please fix this, and we haven't fixed it. And I want to make sure that they're not going to get so frustrated that they, they file something against us or a civil suit or a class action for that matter. So thank you. Thank you. I, I wanted to ask, and Chairman Robinson, maybe this is to you, maybe it's to you, Superintendent Darty. You know, we, we've heard, and I want to hear from everybody here who came here to speak tonight. I, I want to hear what people have to say. I, what, what strikes me at this point is that I've heard a number of people speak with and, and provide some really concrete proposals here that, to me, you know, seem to have been well thought out. Um, they're born of, of many different people's experiences. Um, this proposal to have a language-based learning disability task force strikes me as, a, as one way that we could uh, <coughs> work together to address the needs of these students and these parents. So I want to get behind this and say that I'd like to see it on a future school committee agenda. I'd like to hear the superintendent give us updates on how these concerns are being identified and how they're being responded to. And I'd like to know what resources you need for the district superintendent to, you know, if, if you feel you need more resources, what those are, or is it a question of redistributing existing resources? We want to work together with, with you on this, but um, look, there were, there's some pretty specific things here. There's a task force with a proposed um, list of membership. There's a request for entrance and exit criteria for specific programs. Um, there's a request that uh, we provide sufficiently measurable and concrete goals. Um, and a request for an accounting for students that are on IEPs and are not in any of our specific in-house programs. And that's, I think, the majority of our students uh, identified as special ed, right, by, mm -hmm. by several hundred, yeah. right? Yeah. So, so there's a lot of work together. And when, when we have parents and, and volunteers coming together to ask us to work together to address the needs of, of students in a thoughtful way, which is this was a lot of work, and, and I think quite a bit of courage on the people in this room to come here and speak. It's not easy to sit in front of this board. I've been in that chair. And, it's a little hard until you get used to it, I know. It's, it's, we're all kind of you know, list, listing as best we can, but it takes a lot of courage to show up here and spend, you know, what, people have been sitting here two hours, three hours, mm -hmm. and you know, I have no problem with staying as long as it takes to hear everyone out, but I, I just want to say that I want to know how we can help make sure that, that we respond with at least another agenda item and a separate discussion to move these considerations forward. So, yes. I, I appreciate Mr. Bobbin, but I just really would like to say we have a group of administrators here who have, haven't looked at that other than to listen to it be read. And I really think that we should let them take a look at it and put their imprint also on how to put that task force together. And I think one part of the task force said that it's free. There is nothing free when we're consuming resources. So I think that as 
we show respect for our administration, they should have an opportunity to take a look at that and look at things that they may already have in place. And again, I'm going to go back to saying that the CPAC, th this has to be connected in my mind. That is an advisory council to us with regard to special education. So I think there has to be a connection. And so I think I'll sit down with the superintendent between now and, and report back well, I would at like the next in meeting. the director. And, oh, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And, and re we'll report back at the next meeting as to, you know, what, uh, you know, what we're going to do. I, I agree. Uh, all, uh, I appreciate the, all the feedback and, and suggestions and, and uh, you know, want to kind of just l step back, look at them and debrief and, and I promise they'll report back at the next meeting. Yes, just at one point it, it's not a complaint it's not it, it's it's the reality is um, in our budgets and I use special education because that's what we're focused on this evening the there has been less priority and emphasis put on getting more support for uh, administrators and clerical support and get it as close to the classroom as possible um, I would, I would argue that we need to start having a greater conversation and that you need, they're equal. You, you, you need to have teachers who are well trained, but you also need to have enough administrative and clerical staff to support those teachers. Because I think some of the things that you're hearing tonight isn't because we're not trying, it's because we just don't have the resources the supervisory resources, the clerical resources, um, to do the things necessary to support teachers. Last year in the budget process, when we were talking about the override budget and the things we needed in there, there were things in there that were for clerical staff and for special education administration. And those are the types of things that we're going to need to look at again this year. Because those are critical to this overall success of, of what we're talking about. Thank you. Okay. Yes. And I appreciate that, that you don't have the resources, and that's, that's really, um, but because we don't have the resources, it forces our special ed teachers to fit these kids into a model that they can only deal Thank with. You. And as a result, my son's not reading where, where he should be, and we have a lot of kids that are going to be pushed through the system illiterate. So what do you do? This is why we're having out of district placement and spending more money. It's a vicious cycle. Oh, okay. So mm -hmm. I don't want my son to be out of district, or I'm sure most people don't would rather not. But what do you do if you if you have this group of children that are not being educated? And I know you don't. Nobody wants that, but it's just what do you do? So I don't know what we're at a loss, and this is the source of the frustration. And this, it creates this adversarial, mm -hmm. and we're not blaming the teachers or anything, it's just that's what happens. So, you know, I encourage you to look at those reports that we're getting to the district by the parents. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> I think, are those uh, microphones so up in the I'm not ceiling? sure if those are working. Uh, I don't think they are. Um, I've been working here for, I don't know, 15 or 18 years, and um, Karen Rules is my fifth special ed director, and I just have to say that she is by far the best. The last few years, we've had more training, we've had more services come down, I need materials, I get them, there's a process to ask for things, we have team chairs that know what they're doing in our buildings, so I know that everyone is really frustrated about what's happened in the past, but I really feel like we need to give us all a little bit of time under her leadership because we're going to get there. There's just no question that we're going to get there. Um, and I, I feel I feel badly. I'm a mom too, and my kids have struggled too. And there's nothing worse. There's nothing worse than your kids being in pain, right? I mean, mm -hmm. we all know it. Um, uh, but I, I think that if we can trust each other and work together, we're going to get there. I really, I really, you know, you would work together, right? You're smiling. I love her. <laughs> <laughs> Task force leader right there. Yeah. <laughs> and I love Allison, right? I think they have a great working with 
Thank you. That anyone else? So, uh, thank you uh, for all the positive. You know, it was. I mean, for keeping it positive with the input on difficult uh, conversation and uh, actually probably a better constructive conversation. So we'll, uh, you know, get get right get back or with some feedback on the suggestions for the next meeting so yes mr Paul. i was just going to ask housekeeping um could all the slides that were presented go into somewhere where people can access them after they'll be the in the the packet that's posted and then any handouts that were discussed you scrub clean of any student identifying information if if the speaker wants to include them to give them an opportunity so there was this letter from the defendant uh, I think there was Lin one. Linda will need a copy of everything. Yeah, well, I'll leave my copy. Enough. Gary's copy is here. I have a copy from Gary. I can give to um, and then if there's any costs associated with this by town meeting, just that we're ready to be able to answer that question associated with replying to the OCR complaint. I don't know what the legal bills are, if they amount to anything, but to the extent there, there was a taxpayer cost to all this, I just would want to be prepared with that by town meeting. Again, thank you, everybody. Uh, and uh, that concludes the agenda for this evening. Uh, motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All those in favor? Five zero. Thank you.